I will admonish when. Okay. Please be seated. Before we resume, I do want to just remind everyone in the audience that this is a courtroom. I expect appropriate decorum. Mr. Hogan, you may proceed. Yeah, the witness has not been sworn. I was going to officially call him. <coughs> yeah. Oh. At this time, the defense would call Bill Zelensky. Please raise your right hand and state your name for the record. William C. Zelensky. Do you solemnly swear the testimony you will provide will be the truth, whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? Yes, I do. Bill, can you please spell your last name for the record? Z-E-L-E-N-S-K-I. And it's okay if I call you Bill? Yes. Bill, on October 19th of 2020, what was your intent? Uh, my intent was to find and return my animal safely home. Were you looking to find Riley? No. Were you looking to hurt Riley? Absolutely not. Did you intend to shoot Riley that night? No. Did you intend to kill Riley that night? Absolutely not. Did you want Riley to die? No. You need those. Are you okay to continue? Yes. So before we get to that night, I want to back up quite a ways in your life. You have an interest in animals. Yes. When did you first become interested in animals? Um, as early as I can remember, I always was very interested and enjoyed spending time uh, with animals and nature. Why? Um, my father uh, took us on, you know, nature walks and uh, introduced us to the, the native animals, uh, fish, birds, reptiles, amphibians, mammals, everything, and uh, I just really enjoyed it. Now, a lot's been said throughout this trial about snakes and lizards being gross. How do you feel about them? Uh, I'm the exact opposite. I've uh, I've actually spent my life doing education programs and, and, and spending time with these animals, and uh, I love them. I think they're fascinating. Did you do anything with the animals back in high school? I did. I did quite a bit. What did you do? Uh, I went to uh, uh, Wisconsin Herpetology Society meetings to learn all about them, and then I started uh, collecting them. Um, reproducing them, uh, trading, buying, selling. And did you do anything with a pet store in the area? I did. I, uh, I sold snakes that I had produced. I, I had baby snakes and I'd sell them on consignment through the pet store. And what do you mean by consignment? Uh, I would take the offspring that I had produced and they would uh, put them on display and sell them. And, and so then when the animals sold, they would keep a percentage of the proceeds for themselves, and then they would give me the rest. And you said you did that with the pet store? Yeah, I have a heart pet center in Racine. Did you do anything else 
with the pet store? Yeah, uh, as soon as I was legally old enough to work there, they asked if I would be interested in employment because uh, they could see how much I cared for the animals. And uh, I, I did. I wanted to work there, so I started working at Have a Heart Pet Center. And what was your job at the pet store? Uh, I became the reptile department manager, and uh, I was in charge of maintaining and caring for and uh, displaying and selling all the reptiles and amphibians. Uh, but I also helped out with all the other animals in the pet store as well. It sounds like your focus was on the reptiles and amphibians. Yes. Um, at some point, were you ever contacted by a zoo? Yes. Uh, Tell me about that. The Milwaukee County Zoo was a large zoo close in the area, and uh, I, somehow they had found out that I was interested and had uh, an ability to find uh, exotic reptiles and amphibians. And they were looking for some European legless lizards. And I said, I can find some of those for you. And so I did. And uh, they ended up purchasing them from me. And did that expand to any other areas? It did. Uh, I started working with uh, other zoos and uh, pet stores, other pet stores. And uh, the more I did it, the more contacts I made and the more the word spread uh, through the exotic animal industry that I was someone that uh, did a good job. And, and so other zoos and uh, stores and collectors would contact me. And it sounds like this was you know, mainly snakes and lizards and some rare. Did you ever expand into more rare or exotic animals? I did. As I got more experienced and um, more familiar, uh, the more exotic and rare animals take more specific care requirements. They're not for beginners. And so I started getting into the the harder to find, more uh, exotic, and some of the more specialized, hard to keep uh, animals. Were any of those animals early on dangerous? Uh, not at first, but as I got more experienced, then yes, I moved into uh, venomous uh, snakes and lizards. We heard some testimony in this trial about somebody calling the animals poisonous versus venomous. What's the difference? Uh, that's a great question. Uh, poisonous means if you ingest that, you are going to get sick or die. Uh, all amphibians, like frogs, are poisonous, like poison dart frogs. Uh, snakes are not poisonous, they're venomous. And venom is something that needs to be injected, uh, such as a fang of a, a snake. And uh, that's the main difference. So. It's poisonous if I eat it, it's venomous if it tries to eat me and I die. Yes, or it bites you in defensive. Okay. Uh, yeah, correct. Um, and it sounds like you've been around animals for a really long time. Yes. And would you say you loved animals? Oh, absolutely. 100%, yes. What did you love so much about them? Um, I just had such a deep respect for them. And uh, they are very unique. Every animal uh, has something about it that, uh, you know, uh, is special. Um, uh, some people say I hate spiders, but I look at the way they are, and, and it's not like any other animal. Or a snake uh, is unique. And um, uh, there's beautiful colors, there's beautiful patterns, there's different ways that they move. Uh, the way they interact with their environment. Uh, it's just, um, I can enjoy and appreciate all of God's creation. Did these animals ever give you affection? Oh, well, absolutely, yes. And how does a snake give you affection? Well, I guess that's open for interpretation. Um, but... Uh, a lot of the uh, snakes and lizards, uh, y you know, they'd, uh, I handled them and they'd curl up around my neck and I could put a snake around my neck and it would just cuddle down in or put it on my lap and it would sit there and uh, 
it might be just because it enjoyed the heat from my body and they're cold-blooded and like the heat. Uh, but I tend to think that uh, some of the ones you, I had for a long time could appreciate I was the one that took care of them. And did you give them affection back? Oh, definitely, yeah. Uh, I remember specifically I had some tortoises and I'd scratch them on the top of their head uh, because there's no way for them to reach. And they'd come over and uh, I'd scratch them on the top of their head and they'd stick their neck out as far as they could to get a good scratch. So kind of like what dogs sometimes do when you scratch them behind the ears? Yeah. And I've got a little dog as well who does the same thing. <laughs> um, I want to kind of focus more now on some of the venomous reptiles. What kind of care do those types of animals need? Uh, well, the first thing is they need a, a climate-controlled environment so the temperature and the humidity is appropriate because uh, they're cold-blooded. And uh, then they need uh, to feel secure, so they need a, a hide a box or a, a something they can go into to, to have their own little home inside the enclosure. And, uh, and I can't imagine you went from ordinary snakes and stuff to the venomous type. What did you do to be able to be comfortable around them? Well, what I did is I, I talked to many other reptile keepers who had more experience and, and had kept venomous. And they told me exactly what uh, special equipment I would need and how to set up an enclosure so it's secure. And, and the hide boxes would have little slide doors to be able to shut them. And uh, then what I did is uh, what was recommended, keep a very aggressive, not friendly, bitey species of snake that's not venomous, but it wants to bite you. And then use the specialized equipment on that snake and treat it as if it is venomous. And you're gonna make a mistake or two and you're gonna get bit. And then after you've done that for a long enough period of time that you don't get bit and you feel more comfortable handling those venomous snakes, then you could start out with a venomous snake. So you start with, it sounds sort of like a trainer snake. Yeah, exactly. Um, I, I heard you mention some special, you said they need special equipment to yeah, handle? Yeah, definitely. What kind of equipment? Uh, there's uh, snake hooks, snake tongs, forceps, uh, leather, like welding gloves, um, and then enclosures that have special hides, and uh, some of them have locks on them. And I know it probably sounds obvious, but why do you need those special hooks and gloves? Uh, because you need to respect the, the strike zone of that snake. Uh, you're never going to free handle it and get yourself into a position where it could bite you. So the snake hooks, you can handle it and move it and, and put it from one enclosure to the other without actually touching it. And so you're a safe distance away, so you have to know how to maneuver those hooks because some of them are fairly squiggly and they don't want to stay on a hook. So you got to know how to, to do it. And you mentioned special enclosures. Yes. Tell me more about that. Uh, with a venomous snake, you have to take extra precautions to make sure that that enclosure is 100% uh, sealed tight, unescapable. Um, because if a non-venomous one gets out, it's not good, but it's, it's not as hazardous. If a venomous one gets out, that's a big, big problem. And I think you mentioned earlier some special climate. Yeah. Definitely. Um, some of the more rare reptiles, um, but all reptiles, need a specific temperature and humidity. And uh, some of them are very specific. So I would have a, a climate controlled rooms where the temperature in the room was, say, 80 degrees, which isn't comfortable for me, but that's what the animals need. And then some would have special heat lamps on the cage itself because that particular one needed an even higher temperature and some needed more humidity so they'd have a special substrate that holds the moisture and then the desert ones would have one that did the opposite. And what would these reptiles eat? Uh, it depends on the reptiles but uh, most of the snakes uh, and lizards would eat uh, rodents, frozen thawed rodents. Are those things you can just go buy at the store? Uh, 
I, th I think that some of the pet stores like Petco might sell them, but uh, I bought them uh, direct from uh, rodent breeders. Like there's uh, uh, multiple large companies that just sell rodents to uh, people like me who raise reptiles. And why would you buy them from a special company? Uh, because you need to know the food items are uh, good, clean, safe uh, food items. Uh, you can't just catch a mouse in the backyard and feed it to your snake because that mouse probably has uh, parasites and diseases and it could have poison in it system. Uh, so you buy high quality rodents from a company that you know has uh, good healthy uh, rats and mice so the snake's healthy. With, without these special conditions or special tools, are there risks involved in having these types of animals? Oh my goodness, yes. Uh, a lot of risks to the animals and t to the people. You mentioned risk to the animals. What kinds of risks would it be to the animals? Well, if they don't have the proper temperatures, uh, they'll get sick, a respiratory infection. Uh, if they don't have the proper humidity, uh, they won't shed properly. The skin will get uh, stuck on when they shed their eyes and, and uh, cause problems. If they don't have a, a proper meal, they definitely get sick. Uh, there's lots of problems where they could get sick and die. And you mentioned risks to others. Yeah, definitely. What kind of risks? Well, with the venomous uh, reptiles, if you don't know how to properly handle them, uh, or if you don't have the proper equipment, uh, it's a very, very high likelihood that you're going to get bit. And depending on which venomous animal it is, uh, a bite could mean just a trip to the hospital, or, or it could mean death. Were some of the venomous reptiles more venomous than others? Absolutely. There's, there's some that uh, have a neurotoxic venom, some have a hemotoxic venom, some have you know, small amounts of venom, some have large amounts of venom. Uh, so yeah, there's different levels of uh, danger with what type of venom it is. You, you use some words that I don't recall. Neuro Neuro neurotoxic venom attacks your central nervous system and hemotoxic uh, attacks and destroys flesh and some have both and are some venom more deadly than other venom yes and a, a big factor is how much venom is delivered uh, some snakes have very large venom glands uh, like a gaboon viper for example has a big huge a uh, triangle shaped head and that is because of those huge venom glands and their big fangs and some uh, like say a copperhead uh, it doesn't and it's a very small amount and not very potent venom. You mentioned some of these risks would be to the handlers are there risks to other people? Absolutely uh, there's no doubt about it if you're um, putting a venomous snake in the hands of someone who doesn't know how to handle it, there's a real good chance that it's going to escape. Uh, first, the person trying to handle it will probably get bit. Then when they get bit, they're going to freak out and drop that snake. And then when that snake gets dropped, it's going to slither to wherever it goes next, and anyone in the area is at risk. Even if the handler doesn't get bit, uh, they could not secure the cage properly, and it could get out, and then it's free to... Uh, you know, be in the area that it could bite anybody. And it sounds like a lot of these animals you mentioned aren't native to Wapaka. Uh, yeah, well, none of them are native to Wapaka. And so it sounds like they might just go anywhere if they got out. Yeah, definitely. They would, uh, you know, be lost in a world they're not familiar with, and they would uh, probably try to find somewhere to hide, but yeah, they could go anywhere. Um, and when you were telling me about this, I was surprised, but do you need a permit in Wisconsin to do all these animals and raising these animals? Uh, for the exotic reptiles statewide, no, you don't. Uh, a lot of municipalities have uh, ordinances that regulate them, um, but in the state, there's not a license for keeping anything uh, except the native species. Anything native to the state, the DNR regulates, but the exotics, they don't. 
and so no permit, any special licensing or anything else special you might need? Well, for a lot of the animals I did, I, I had special permits. Like I have a, a USDA license uh, for the mammals, and, and uh, I have uh, Wisconsin DNR captive wildlife permits for some of the native species. And I've got a special conditional use permit uh, from zoning. Uh, so I had uh, special permits and licenses uh, for a lot of the animals I had but not specifically the, the reptiles. So like an alligator, you don't need a special permit to have an alligator? No, you don't. So any of us in the courtroom right now could go get an alligator? Yes, you could. I mean, unless your jurisdiction within your, you know, small uh, jurisdiction had an ordinance against it, you sure could. Do you think that would be a good idea? Uh, unless you're set up for it and know how to take care of a large dangerous animal in the future, I would not recommend it. No, not a good idea. So you talked a lot about the risks associated with these animals. Um, because of those risks, did you keep these animals anywhere special? I did. I, um, I had a, a, a steel building uh, with special rooms that were uh, built uh, specifically with these animals in mind. Uh, so there was a room that I had uh, constructed uh, specifically with the intention of having these reptiles and I had some enclosures built into the, the room. And where was this shed? I was at the uh, end of my driveway, we have a very long driveway off the road and then past my house it dead ends and there's a shed at the end of the driveway. Your house on East Road? That's correct, yes. Um, you also, we heard a lot of testimony about having a property over on Main Street in the city? Yes, 111 North Main Street. And what was the purpose of that property? Um, uh, we purchased it as an investment property because I was hoping to open an exotic uh, pet store where I would sell the, uh, you know, harder to find uh, I guess people call them weird, animals that um, you don't normally see in a run-of-the-mill pet store. And I was also planning to sell uh, artwork of exotic animals. Did you keep any animals there? I did. I uh, started moving some of the uh, animals over uh, for display. What kind of animals did you keep there? Um, I had some turtles and a couple snakes. Um, uh, maybe a frog or two. Did you bring any of the venomous animals? Oh, absolutely not, no. Why not? Uh, they're just not suited for in the city. Uh, in the city limits, um, it wouldn't be appropriate. Why would it be more appropriate to keep them on East Road? Uh, oh, on East Road, uh, you have to go through m multiple doors to get into the, the building, uh, into the room where they're kept, and uh, it's away from the general public. Um, you, you can't even see it from the road, and uh, it's purposely private and away from uh, people. Have you ever had any animals escape? Uh, yes, I have. Well, what kinds of animals have ex escaped? Uh, we've had uh, wallabies that have gotten loose, uh, emus that have jumped over a fence and were running loose. Uh, we had a cow break through a fence one time. You said wallabies, um, I think emus, mm -hmm. cows, not venomous. No, never venomous. No venomous animals ever escaped? Uh, no. I Well, I've been working with like a cobra out in the parking lot and it scurries off for five, ten feet, and then I go get the hook and scoop it right back up, but never out of my sight missing. And is that one of the reasons you kept them there uh, in case they did escape? Exactly, yeah. Yeah, we've got a uh, chunk of land that uh, we own to make sure that uh, if they were to escape, uh, they wouldn't be right in the midst of a bunch of people. And some point in your life, Bill, were you interested in law enforcement? Uh, yes, I was. How? Um, 
I wanted to be a, possibly a game warden or a uh, park ranger and work in uh, the natural resources field uh, as a law enforcement officer. And why did you want to do that? Uh, because I cared so much about the, the animals and the, and the natural resources and nature and uh, I wanted to make sure uh, I could protect it and uh, keep it safe. Keep the nature and animals safe. Well, and people who were out enjoying nature uh, safe also. There's, you have to protect the resource from the, the people and the people, f there's you know, some danger in nature too. And in pursuit of that, did you go on to more education? I did. I, uh, I went to school at uh, University of Wisconsin-Stevens Point uh, for my bachelor's degree in urban forestry, forest recreation, uh, with Myers in biology and environmental law enforcement. Um, and what did that all entail? Uh, I uh, went to uh, courses for uh, five years and uh, I learned all about um, forestry, trees, uh, there's a lot of science behind it. Um, I learned about uh, biology, uh, general courses, and then uh, specifically for the environmental law enforcement, part of that was going to uh, Fox Valley Technical College in Appleton for the 400-hour recruit academy. The 400-hour recruiting academy, I, I know we heard some testimony in this trial about that's required to be like a sworn law enforcement officer. Yeah, that's correct. And you attended that? I did. I uh, had not been hired yet by an agency, but I knew that was my goal, so I uh, attended it and put myself through the academy that all law enforcement officers had to complete at the time to work as a sworn officer. And we heard some testimony that over the years they've increased how long that course is. And when you attended it, it was 400 hours? It was 400 hours. Uh, when I attended, I, I believe I graduated a class of 1999. Okay. And how long or approximately does it take to complete that 400 hours? A couple of months? Yeah. Uh, it was a, a summer uh, course. I went the entire summer. Um, and did you ultimately graduate from UW-Stevens Point? I did, yes. And did you complete this Fox Valley Technical College program before or after? I graduated from the Fox Valley Tech program in 99, and then I graduated from uh, University of Wisconsin at Stevens Point in 2000. Okay. I want to talk a little bit more about what you learned in the Fox Valley Technical College training program. Sure. What did that all entail? What sort of training did you receive? There was uh, quite a, a few different courses, uh, 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 chapters or um, fields. Uh, we'd start out with uh, some book work, the legal law, uh, statutes, uh, criminal code, and uh, we'd do uh, hands-on training like uh, DAT or defensive and arrest tactics where we would learn how to um, defend ourselves and arrest people and deal with uh, physical altercations. Uh, we had... Um, what other topics would you learn about? Uh, there was firearms, uh, there was EVOC, which is uh, driving, uh, criminal investigation, evidence collection, ethics, uh, quite a few different courses. Did you receive training? Was one of the courses in responding to emergencies? Yes, yes it was. I want to talk a little bit, you said DAT. Mm -hmm. What is DAT? Da it stands for Defensive and Arrest Tactics. Okay. And what did you learn in Defense and Arrest Tactics? Um, it was quite a long time ago, but from what I remember, uh, we would, uh, you know, how to deal with a suspect that may or may not be armed, and uh, if it was someone that could potentially have a knife, they would give us a red rubber knife and the suspect would have it hidden and it presented at some point. And we'd have uh, uh, courses on uh, how to defend ourselves if we had to go hands-on. And we'd have uh, courses on how to arrest someone, put handcuffs 
on the person, um, things like that. Um, in that sort of chapter, was there anything about trying to subdue potential suspects? Yes. Uh, basically, if there's going to be a physical altercation, uh, you want to make sure that you go home at the end of the day, so you'd have to subdue the uh, sus suspect. Uh, and so they taught us physically how to do that, yes. Um, and you mentioned they would give you a red rubber knife and hide it on someone. Did you do that in like pairs with other people? Yes, that's correct. We would have a, uh, you know, a partner that we would uh, practice uh, some of the um, moves and, and things with. And we'd have scenarios that we'd go through. Um, you mentioned another um, area was EVOC. Yes. And what's EVOC stand for? That's uh, the driving. We, uh, in the squad car, we'd actually uh, go out onto the course outside and, and have uh, the vehicles that we would use. And did it teach you about all the stuff inside a squad car? Yes. Yes, it did. Uh, it looks like there's a lot of stuff inside squad cars. What, uh, that's correct. What sorts of things did they teach you about how to use? Uh, we, we were taught about uh, the lights, the sirens, the radios. Uh, now there's more and more stuff, computers. Uh, did you learn anything about the, is there a radio system you mentioned? Yes, correct. Uh, that's a very important part. Uh, there's a radio system where you can uh, call on the radio to other officers and to dispatch. So not an AM, FM radio, but actually radioing the dispatch. Correct. And what's so important about that? Um, you have to communicate all the time uh, with dispatch so they know where you are and what's happening. Uh, and they'll do status checks on you to make sure they are updated uh, frequently. And so you learn some of this just people telling you about it, did you actually get to practice some things in the driving? Absolutely. Uh, th that's, we did a mostly that, um, where we would have, um, you know, like uh, mock high-speed chases, where uh, we would be in the pursuit vehicle, and then an instructor would be in the suspect vehicle. And we'd also have an instructor with us in, in the pursuit vehicle, and, and uh, we would have to demonstrate uh, our ability to act as a police officer and chase the suspect the entire time calling out on the radio to, to dispatch. Uh, every turn we made and uh, e every time we changed uh, you know, directions or, or whatnot, we would have to radio that into dispatch. That was part of the, tr the training. Did they tell you why that was so important? Yeah, definitely. Uh, they did because if, if dispatch doesn't know where you are and you call for help, they don't even know where to, to send the help to. Say uh, you crash, or say the suspect uh, gets out of the vehicle and uh, comes to you. They don't know where you are unless you're constantly giving them an update on your location. So that's why it's so important. And then if there's other officers in the area responding, they need to know where to go. And when they had you do this, did they have, you know, you mentioned a, a fake suspect that you're chasing after other potential traffic that you had to maneuver around? Yes, there was, uh, there was a lot of uh, training on maneuvering the vehicle uh, properly, too. Uh, they would uh, also set up cones in different uh, positions. And uh, at the last minute, they tell you if you had to go right or left to evade an um, you know, obstacle in the road. And so you'd have to do very quick maneuvers uh, uh, split-second decisions and um, and then to control the vehicle there's also a skid pad where uh, it's purposely slick and uh, easy to lose control and you have to maintain control on the slick or regain control on the slick surface and you mentioned another uh, area at this 400 law enforcement recruitment training was firearms Yes, that's correct. What did you learn under that chapter or topic? Uh, everything from the uh, different parts of the gun, how to uh, clean the gun, disassemble the gun, 
um, how to hold the gun properly, how to fire the gun, how to uh, holster the gun, take it out of the holster, how to um, aim, fire the gun, reload the gun. And did that include classroom and hands-on training as well? That's correct, yes. What sort of hands-on training did you learn? Uh, quite a bit. We'd actually have the guns that we would take apart, uh, identify all the parts, clean them. Uh, we would practice gripping them, aiming them, uh, drawing them. And then once we were more familiar with that, handling them, we would start to actually aim and shoot them. And then as we got better at that, shooting them, we would uh, learn how to very quickly uh, take the magazine out and put another magazine in. Uh, if the gun got jammed, which if you shoot enough rounds, eventually it's going to, we'd have to learn how to clear that jam and then uh, continue firing. You mentioned you learned how to, how to and maybe when to draw a firearm? That's correct, yes. And what special things did you learn in how or when to draw a firearm? Uh, how to draw the firearm, you, you want to make sure that you have a good solid grip and you want to make sure that you're uh, coming straight up out of the holster, not at an angle so it doesn't get stuck. And uh, when to draw the firearm is uh, when you perceive a threat uh, or there's a threat that uh, is, you know, potentially hazardous enough that you're going to need it. We heard some testimony from an officer um, previously about something called a low ready position. Have you heard of that? Uh, yes. And can you describe what you remember learning about low ready position? It's when you uh, draw your uh, service weapon out of the holster and have it in your hand but not uh, aimed at anything like a suspect so you keep it down um, but ready. And when would you need to do that? Um, When you uh, have a possible threat in the area, um, but not a, a target uh, that uh, you're planning on uh, needing to f use the firearm, but in the foreseeable future, you're gonna need it uh, more ready than still in the holster. So is, did they teach you about having your firearm ready before you might need it? Exactly, yes. Um, and why, why is that so important? Um, because if you need it and it's still in the holster and you're fumbling around trying to get it out, uh, by the time you do, it's going to be too late. And uh, one thing I really remember is th they taught us about what you would normally think a safe distance for someone to be would be. Uh, say someone was five feet away. Is that a safe distance? 10 feet away, 15 feet away. What if they had a knife? What if they had a gun? Oh, I learned, and I was really surprised by this, that the suspect can close that gap so much faster than you would normally think that you have to be ready uh, way before a normal uh, person would think. And so uh, you want to have that uh, ready before the, the threat is even uh, close or even present, just the um, thought that there might be a threat. I know, for one instance, if you're going up a, a narrow stairwell to a call where there might be a violent suspect, uh, you're going to want to have your a firearm out while you're going up that narrow stairwell, even before you see the suspect, because they could just pop out at any moment. You mentioned um, learning how to properly grip a firearm. Yes. And why is a grip so important? Uh, for a number of reasons. Number one, you want to have a good, solid, strong grip uh, so you're in control of that firearm. You want it high on the tang, and uh, that means high up on the grip. I was going to say high on the tang. I don't think yeah, anyone might know uh, You want it uh, snug up against what's called a tang, so it's a solid grip because if it's a very loose, floppy a grip, uh, number one, the firearm's not being controlled. It could be uh, taken away. And number two, it has more a likelihood to uh, misfire and uh, get jammed. And you can't aim it as well. And what sort of firearms were you 
training in specifically? Uh, mostly we used a, a nine millimeter uh, semi-automatic uh, pistol. Is that a fairly common firearm? Yes. Nine millimeter, pretty common? Uh, at the time, that was the standard. Uh, now they've moved up to a larger caliber for service weapons, but nine millimeter is a very common round. Um, another chapter that you mentioned was about investigating crimes. Yes. And tell me about that. What did that entail? Uh, we learned um, through uh, scenarios, again, how to uh, follow leads, um, uh, collect evidence, uh, interview possible suspects, uh, how to ask questions and what questions to ask. Um, also how to look at physical evidence, such as a broken window to see if it was broken in or out, uh, collect fingerprints, uh, take photographs. You mentioned speaking with potential suspects. What about speaking with potential witnesses? Yes, definitely. And why is that so important? Uh, that's very important because if you can uh, find uh, witnesses, especially right uh, immediately after some incident took place, uh, they can provide lots of information. And if you can get to those witnesses soon and while well, the memories are fresh, they can be documented. And the more witnesses you can find, the better. So the more people you're able to speak to, better chances of somebody giving you useful information? Exactly. Just uh, let me interrupt. Council approach. Record. Thank you, Your Honor. Bill, um, you mentioned one of the chapters, or maybe you didn't, was there a specific section about how to respond to emergencies? Uh, yes. And what did you learn in that chapter, that section? I was getting a lot of information, um, but I know one of the main takeaways is uh, when responding to emergencies, uh, you want to remain professional and you want to remain calm and uh, you want to pay attention to the details and uh, control the situation. And did they teach you why that's so important? Uh, yes. Uh, the way that you perform your duties uh, is going to reflect uh, on everybody in the area and if you remain calm and are professional um, it tends to uh, keep other people a call and uh, if you pay attention to the details you can relay that information uh, to people that might need it. People that might, might need it such as who? Uh, other responding officers to dispatch to emergency personnel, fire department, uh, other investigators, uh, the DA. And so you learned it's important to be able to pay attention to detail. Why is that so important? Uh, it's so important because uh, if you don't, uh, you, you won't be able to uh, put the pieces uh, uh, together of what took place. And uh, if you pay attention to details, uh, then you'll have more knowledge about that situation. And you, would you be able to share that with other people who needed that information? Exactly. Um, you said you completed that training, the 400-hour training program in, I think you said the summer of 1999? That's correct. Um, 
And that was before you graduated UW Stevens Point. Yes, that's correct. What happened after you graduated UW Stevens Point? After I graduated, I uh, uh, went out and uh, searched for employment. And uh, in law enforcement, I, I did. I um, I actually was very happy to find a job with uh, Hartman Creek State Park outside of Wapaki here as an LT uh, park ranger. An LT? LTE, uh, limited term employment. Yeah, because it's a state park. Uh, it's only needed for rangers uh, during the months uh, like spring and summer and fall. And when you were hired there, is that when you you knew it was just going to be for a limited term? Uh, yes, correct. Um, after that ended, what did you do? Um, I applied to the uh, city of Wapaka Police Department and uh, was uh, hired. And when was that? I believe uh, probably 2001. 2002, early 2000s. And how long did you work with the Wapaka Police Department? I'd say about three and a half to four years. When you were hired by the police department, did they have any additional training? Yes, there was. There was uh, kind of like on the job training, it's called the FTO or Field Training Officer Program. And we heard another officer testify a little bit about field training officer. Can you tell us more about what that meant? Yeah, uh, you're paired up with a more experienced seasoned officer in the department and uh, you work uh, together and uh, you ride along in the same squad car and respond to all the calls together and uh, at first the FTO uh, does most of the uh, you know contact to show you how to do it and then uh, as you progress through the program they more sit back and let you take over doing it and then you can ask them questions and they can give you uh, pointers and information and how long did the FTO or field training officer last I think it was a couple months two three months and after that ended it was on your own uh, Sort of, yes. Uh, I, you're on your own, except you always have the uh, support of uh, the other officers. So um, I was lucky enough to have a, another a sergeant that I got along with well and, and uh, could ask him questions uh, if I needed to about things. Even after the field training officer was done? Yes, that's correct. Um, in addition to the field training officer, was there anything else that you needed to learn when you became a police officer with the city of Opaca? There was a lot of things I needed to learn. Um, you know, we needed to know the jurisdiction, so where the city limits uh, started and stopped, uh, all the uh, street names, um, uh, the 10 codes that they used here on the radio, um, the, the different channels, uh, needed to know the speed limits on which roads uh, were which. Um, you mentioned the street names, so you had to learn all the street names in Wapaka? Every single one, yes. I imagine that took quite some time. Uh, it did. Uh, I, I wasn't born and raised here, so um, it did. It took quite a while for me to memorize all the roads, but it was important so you could always, you know, call out your location. While you were a Wapaka police officer, did you respond to emergency calls? Yes, I did. And what types of emergency calls did you respond to? Um, there were uh, medical emergencies. If someone, uh, you know, was having a, a possible heart attack or um, a diabetic who had gone unconscious, um, you know, any kind of medical situation. Uh, we also went to uh, a lot of traffic accidents, traffic accidents with uh, multiple vehicles, uh, injuries. Uh, we'd go to domestic disputes, um, all kinds of emergency calls. And approximately how many emergency calls would you say on average per week? Uh, emergency call, I would say at least one a week. Once a week for the three and a half, four years? Yeah. 
So if my math is correct, roughly 150 to 200. That sounds about right, yeah. Did you ever have to respond to situations involving armed or hostile suspects? Uh, yes. How many of those would you say? Um, not as many armed, but hostile, uh, possibly hostile domestic. I, I, I would say maybe one every month, month or two. And what sort of situations would you engage with a hostile suspect? Um, I remember some calls uh, uh, like domestic disturbances where there's a, a altercation between uh, two people. Um, also like a, a hotel or a bar could call and say we have a uh, unruly, you know, a fight or drunk or whatnot. Um, and, it in any of those calls, did you have to utilize your firearm? Yes. Uh, how so? Um, I utilized my firearm uh, more than once just um, in situations where you're walking into a potentially dangerous situation. Uh, again, I remember going up uh, a stairwell to a situation that we had a report of uh, uh, possibly armed suspect and uh, other situations where you're entering a situation that there are violent or armed suspects. Did you ever have to discharge your firearm? Uh, thankfully no I did not. You mentioned I think you started in 2001 um, or 2002 at Wapaka Police Department? That sounds right. And you were there approximately three and a half to four years. That's correct. What did you do after you left the force? I, I started working uh, outdoors with uh, Anderson Tree Service, and I uh, got more heavily into the exotic animals. And then I also started working at uh, uh, Marina and Shawano selling boats, motors, ATVs, snowmobiles, outdoor recreation items. You mentioned you got more involved in exotic animals were you continuing that while you were at, in college and on the Wapaka Police Department? Uh, yes, I, I have always had an extensive collection of exotic animals, uh, mostly reptiles and amphibians, and I continued to buy, sell, and trade them, and I had a couple of pet stores that I supply. Um, and you mentioned some other businesses that you worked at. Yes. Anderson Tree Service? Uh, yes. Uh, my neighbor actually owned it at the time I first started working with him. Uh, and I eventually purchased the company and became the owner of Anderson Tree Service. Um, and then at some point is when you bought the property on Main Street? Uh, yeah, years later. Okay. And that was going to be another business for you to run? Um, it was going to be the exotic animal business, but then move from a more of a, a wholesale and working directly just with the zoos uh, to more of a retail. And I want to talk to you a little bit about April. Okay. Uh, when did you meet April? I met her uh, my second year of college. I think it would be about 1996 or 7. And how did you meet her? Uh, she was a friend of a friend, and uh, a friend of mine's girlfriend was her college roommate. And so I met her through them. And was April, she was also a student at... UW Stevens Point? That's correct. Um, when you attended the 400 hour training program at Fox Valley Tech, mm -hmm. did you still live in Stevens Point? I uh, know since it was a months long uh, program, I found a place in uh, Appleton. A friend of mine uh, and I were both taking the academy, so we found a, a place to rent. And then after that, you moved back to Stevens Point to finish up school? Yes, that's correct. And where was April during all that time? Uh, during the, the uh, time we were at school, uh, we uh, lived in houses around uh, Stevens Point. Uh, April and I and some other roommates lived together. And uh, we went from you know one house to the next for different semesters. And when you, do you remember when you got married? I think it was in uh, 
2007. Okay. Um, had you started dating when you first met April? Uh, yeah, a short time after I met her. Uh, we, we were um, dating um, for about 10 years before we uh, ended up getting married. And when, when exactly do you remember uh, getting the house on East Road? Um, it was not much within the year after I got hired by the Wapak Police Department. I know they had a residency requirement uh, that I needed to fulfill. And so uh, shortly after getting hired, we started looking at houses in the Wapak area. And the house on East Road met those residency requirements? Yeah, just. It, uh, we had a seven mile radius that we needed to be within and that was just within the seven mile radius. Uh, so it worked. And I know you mentioned that at East Road is where you had the shed to keep the animals. Was that a sort of a, a draw to getting that house as well? The location was a very big draw because of the privacy it was far off the road and uh, had uh, the potential to have uh, enclosures and, and outbuildings and, and you know it was a great place to accommodate animals. It was zoned agricultural. Uh, when did you first meet Tiffany? I met her uh, probably 2002-2003 uh, while I was working as a, a police officer. And how much contact would you have with her then? Um, just sporadic. Uh, I responded to some some calls uh, that she was, you know, involved with. Fair to say, your relationship then was strictly professional. Oh yes, hundred um, percent. And we heard her testify about reconnecting on some trip to Florida. Tell me about that. Uh, yeah, I was going to Daytona, Florida, for a reptile uh, breeders expo. It's a national event that. Uh, takes place every year and I had uh, a couple of friends that were planning on going who at the last minute couldn't and so I was looking for someone uh, to take uh, uh, the trip with me so I wouldn't be driving all the way to Florida by myself and a mutual friend of ours suggested that she would be free and interested in going and it sounds like she was she was uh, so I I didn't really even know it was her when I uh, called to ask if she wanted to go on the trip um, but then once I uh, saw her in person, I recognized her and it worked out well. And it sounds like that relationship became intimate. It did. Um, and at that time, do you remember the year when that trip occurred? I think it was uh, August of uh, 2019. And at that time you were married? Yes. And. Did Tiffany know that you were married? Yes, absolutely. And what about April? Did she know that you were taking Tiffany on this trip? Yes, 100%. And what was everybody's thoughts about it? Uh, everyone was uh, good with it, happy with it. So April was aware of the intimate relationship between you and Tiffany? Uh, yes, uh, she participated in it. She was. Uh, uh, happy with it. And with, after spending that time with Tiffany and becoming intimate, did you ultimately meet her family? I did. And tell me about her family. Um, on the trip, we stopped at her mother's uh, in Alabama, and I met her mother, and we spent some time together. Um, it went well. I thought she was you know, very welcoming and nice. Uh, made me some tea and we sat around at campfire. Maybe the southern hospitality we hear about? Absolutely. And uh, then when we got back from the trip, um, I remember meeting uh, her son, um, Riley, and his son, Jackson. And um, then a time, you know, after that, I eventually met Rowan. And then I, after that, met her son, Reagan. Tell me about when you first met Riley. Um, on the way back uh, from the Reptile Breeders Expo, there's a, a Nike outlet store. I don't remember what state it was in, but uh, we stopped because 
uh, her sons really, really liked Nike. And uh, so we were in the store and I remember she was uh, texting pictures of some sneakers uh, to Riley asking which ones uh, Rowan would like and getting his advice. And then after that we picked out sneakers for uh, Riley and then I helped her pick out sneakers for uh, Jackson. And did you, is that when you first met Riley, when you got, gave them the, the sneakers? Yeah, when we got back, uh, we went to his uh, apartment uh, on Granite Street and uh, we're there to give him the sneakers for him and his son. And that's when I met him. And that was the first time you had met Riley? I might have seen him in the stroller when he was a little baby, uh, but I didn't really meet him. And did you ever spend a lot of time with Riley? Uh, yeah, I did after that. And what would you guys do together? Um, all kinds of stuff. Um, uh, we would go uh, play basketball. Um, he actually helped me with some tree jobs where uh, he would do uh, tree work with me. Um, I'd give him rides to wherever he needed to go. Uh, we'd hang out. He, he liked playing the video games, so we would do that every once in a while. Typical teenager stuff. Yeah. Um, did you and April ever have any kids? Uh, no, just the animals. Were the animals like your kids? Yeah, uh, exactly. Um, I had a, a troop of ringtail lemurs uh, for over 20 years, and they're a small primate from Madagascar, like a monkey. And uh, they're very affectionate, and they'd sit on my shoulder, and they'd sit on my lap, and I pet them and feed them treats, and um, yeah, they were like my kids. Did you consider Riley like a kid? Uh, you know, at first, not so much, but then as I got to know him and I spent more time with him, uh, yeah, he definitely, um, you know, became like family to me. Did Riley ever help you out with the animals? Uh, not a lot. Uh, he came over once, I remember, and, and um, he was going to feed uh, some minnows to some fish and some turtles for me. Do you ever deal with the, the venomous reptiles? Oh, absolutely not, no. Would you let him? No, um, it, no. It would take uh, a lot of time to uh, you know train him and get him experienced to the point where it would be safe. And, and uh, he wasn't out there with the animals enough to do that. Tell me um, about Riley's physical characteristics. Um, he was uh, thinner than me, <laughs> um, but uh, very st strong, um, a low body uh, fat, high muscle content. Um, I don't know if people say wiry, but um, he was very quick. Uh, he was extremely fast. I know uh, one time he was running after a dog, a loose dog, and he just, he's so quick. Uh, and we'd play basketball together and, you know, he'd leave me in the dust, obviously. And he'd uh, scamper up the trees and, and his muscles. Um, he was very strong. He, you know, he'd hold the, the chainsaw and the, and the limbs and uh, he was in good physical shape. Um. Now, you have some physical limitations as you sit here today. I do now, yes. And, you know, we don't have to get into the specifics, but it's a medical sort of condition that you have right now? Uh, yes. Uh, I've got a pretty serious and rare disease. Back in 2019, 2020, were you in the same physical condition? Uh, no, not at all. Uh, and what was different about you physically in 2019, 2020? Um, 2020, I probably weighed 195 pounds. Uh, I have uh, a massive amount of retained fluid right now. I probably have 50 to 60 pounds of, of fluid that I did not have. Um, I, I had no problems standing, walking, running, jumping. Um, you know, and now I, I can't really do much of that at all. Um, without those limitations, would, would you say Riley was still faster than you? Oh, much, much faster, yes. What about stronger than you? Uh, yeah, he was stronger than I was. 
And <clears throat> it, you had mentioned something about a chainsaw. Is that from seeing him helping you in the tree service company? Yes, yeah, correct. So you got to see how strong he was sort of up close. Yeah. Uh, he could do things that I uh, you wish I could do still and uh, wish I could have done then. Uh, he could scamper up those trees and, and uh, throw things around um, much quicker and much more efficiently than I was because, you know, unfortunately I was getting old. <laughs> um, as you got to know Riley, it, it sounds like you spent a lot of time together, played video games. Um, Was there a bad side of Riley that you saw? Um, I'll sustain. Were you aware of any incidences of, of Riley engaging in violent behaviors? Objection. Yes. I was going to say, let's take a recess. seated. We are on the record outside the presence of the jury. Uh, Mr. Hogan, where are you going with this line of questioning? Your Honor, this is specifically related to the McMorris motion that I filed, um, and it will go ultimately to Bill's state of mind as to why he grabbed the shotgun from his vehicle um, as it relates to the need to defend himself. Any comment, Ms. Isherwood? When we had the pre-trial motion, the discussion was that it may be appropriate if there's a self-defense um, claim in this, but not in order to establish the self-defense claim. I mean, there is nothing at all on the record from anyone um, that this is a self-defense case. Your Honor, it, it can be admitted to show certain actions were done in self-defense. That's what the McMorris line of cases talks about, that it, because it goes to the defendant's state of mind, it's relevant to explaining that state of mind later on in Bill's testimony. And it may be relevant later on, but I think you have to establish some level of we've got a self-defense claim here before we necessarily back in that type of testimony. So the court's ruling is once Bill essentially testifies that he saw Riley as a threat, then we'll be able to get into this. Then I will allow it because you're showing why he felt it and it would go to a state of mind reasonableness and but at this point in time I think it's premature and given the time maybe this would be a good time for an afternoon break anyway. Okay. the record. Go ahead. Thank you. One, I would like um, Mr. Zelensky's answer to the question struck about the violence of Riley. He answered yes. I will direct that to be struck at this point in time. And then just so that we're not always sending the jury out, um, I, I think we need to talk a little bit about self-defense. Um, 
given that self-defense is not available to one who provokes an attack. And according to 93948, a person's privilege to threaten or intentionally use force against another for preventing or terminating what they reasonably be to be an unlawful interference against him. So everything we know in this case, at least so far, is that Mr. Zielinski approached Riley Menente Powell with a gun. Well, I don't think that's accurate. I'm not saying there's been any evidence sufficient to warrant any instruction on it, but the testimony I heard said that uh, Riley Manetti Paul began running from School Street down Van Street, and at that point in time, near the middle of the block, finally met up with Tiffany Powell and Mr. Zelensky. So, I mean, given the most favorable reading of that to the defendant, I can't find that that would completely preclude an instruction. I'm not ready to say there's a basis for it now, but I mean, there it has to be established through testimony, and I'm going to certainly allow him to express. Absolutely, I just don't want, to, when that threshold is reached in the defendant's mind, and if they're gonna go right into McMorris evidence, I think we're gonna need an off the record. I agree. Okay, thank you. I agree. We're ready then. Please be seated. Members of the jury, I am going to strike the response of Mr. Zelensky's last answer to the last question. You may proceed. Thank you, Your Honor. <clears throat> Bill, I want to move to the day that you found out that you had been robbed. Okay? Mm -hmm. Um, how did you find out that you were robbed? Um, the first thing I, uh, the first way I found out was when April called and said, uh, did you move some animal enclosures or take some of the animals out of the reptile room? And I said, no, why is something missing or why do you ask? And she said, yeah, there's, there's things in disarray and there's things missing. And that's how I found out, uh, first of all, that those things are missing. And at some point, did you go to the residence on East Road? I did. And look in that shed? Yes. And how many animals were taken? Um, I can't recall the exact number, but I would say... Uh, Somewhere around 15. And after you found out that the animals had been taken, how did that make you feel? Uh, very upset. I was, um, I was very worried and uh, distraught. Why were you so worried? Because uh, I knew all the animals that were taken needed specialized care and, and uh, environment to survive. And uh, I was really worried too because some of them were very dangerous and uh, in the wrong hands, deadly. Were you worried about the animals themselves? Uh, very worried about the animals themselves, yes. And what were you so worried about the animals themselves? Um, I cared about the animals. I knew that uh, 
without the proper care in the wrong hands, they would, uh, you know, possibly get sick, possibly die, possibly escape. Um, almost certainly, the environmental requirements wouldn't be met unless someone had a, a setup specifically for them. And were you worried about other people? Uh, yes, very. And what other people were you worried about? Uh, specifically, whoever took them, uh, whoever was in contact with them, anyone in the area of where they were being kept. And so some of those animals that we saw throughout this trial, some of them were venomous? Yes, that's correct. Were all of them venomous? Uh, no. Um, and you said that April had called you and told you about the theft of the animals. Did you discover things were taken from you elsewhere? Yes, when she called and notified me about the animals being stolen a short time later, um, I got in my car, which was parked uh, behind Main Street. And uh, when I got in, I noticed uh, items in the car were missing. Such as what? Um, specifically, there was a, a 9 millimeter Smith & Wesson semi-automatic um, handgun in the center council uh, that was missing. And uh, then I also noticed uh, some other items like uh, some money and uh, cell phone, charger and cell phone. Um, later on, did you discover anything else from your car had gone missing? I did. Uh, I didn't initially uh, notice, but because uh, I don't look at it every day, but there's a lock box underneath the passenger seat that's attached uh, with a, a metal cable. Um, and that lock box contained a small 38 special revolver. And that lock box had gone missing? Yeah, the cable had been cut and the whole lock box was gone with the gun inside. And you said the lock box was where? It was underneath the passenger seat. Uh, so it wasn't a visible. Uh, it was kind of a you know, hidden under there, and that's why I didn't notice it originally. Um, and you said there was the 9 millimeter taken. Uh, yes, that was in the center council. Um, was there a clip with the 9 millimeter? Yeah, there was a magazine that I kept separately uh, so the, the gun wasn't loaded while it was in the car, uh, but the a magazine was close by so it could be put in. And earlier you testified that 9 millimeter is a fairly common gun. Yeah, very, very common. And I imagine the ammunition for it is pretty prevalently available? Yeah, it's readily available. Uh, Fleet Farm has it. And there's a, is there a waiting time or a waiting period to actually buy a handgun? Uh, I believe there is. And to your knowledge, is there any requirement, a waiting period to buy ammunition? No, I don't believe there is. So anybody who had taken the 9mm handgun could just go and buy ammunition for it? Yes. Did that concern you? Yes, yes it did. Why? Um, again, in the wrong hands, uh, the firearms are, are deadly. And because they happen at the same time, did that lead you to suspect anything about who might have taken that stuff? It did. Uh, my residence is very private uh, on purpose because of the exotic animals. And so uh, we didn't have a lot of people out there. So not a lot of people knew uh, exactly where we lived and it's hidden from the road. And uh, I parked in the alley behind 111 North Main Street, which again isn't uh, somewhere a lot of people see. and so. The fact that things went missing from my car, where it was parked behind the building on Main Street and in the very private East Road uh, residence, led me to believe it had to be someone who knew both locations and that my car would be there because I was there and that uh, they could access both the car and the property on East Road. And when you discovered that these handguns were missing, uh, what did you do? Um, 
Well, I told April when she was uh, out at the house to report the uh, reptiles and such stolen, then I informed her that she should report the guns stolen. And they, uh, officers responded and said, you can't report it to county, you have to report it to the city. And is that, did you report it to the city? That's exactly what I did. Then I <coughs> contacted the city of Opaca Police Department to let them know that there was a theft of those items from my car in the city limits. Um, and <clears throat> how would you characterize law enforcement's response? Uh, they responded to take the, the reports and uh, uh, initially they, they did everything um, you know that you would to uh, start the complaint and, and speak with me, the, the victim, and April, the victim. And with respect to the animals, what did you think somebody may try to do with the animals? Well, because they were valuable, uh, I didn't think anyone stole them just to have. So I figured they would try to sell them to uh, make a profit and get the money. And because you thought that they might try to sell them, what did you do with that information? Uh, I immediately hit the streets. I, I, uh, I started contacting everybody that I could think of um, locally in the area and also just in the widespread reptile community uh, to let them know what was stolen and to watch for those specific animals. And uh, then if they heard anything about it, to let me know. So you were trying to contact anybody you knew? Absolutely. And it sounds like people in that animal community. Uh, yeah, I have a lot of contacts from uh, the years of uh, doing uh, this type of activity. And I would, uh, like I said, go to national trade shows and conferences. And so I, uh, I know a lot of uh, people around the country. Did you go online at all? I did. And what did you do online? Um, I checked uh, all the sites that I know where people could sell the animals and the handguns. Um, some of the animals were very unique, uh, very rare, and so if someone was advertising one of those animals uh, for sale, I could identify it as mine and then follow that lead. And Bill, I'm going to hand you what's been previously marked as Exhibit 42. We heard some testimony yesterday that that is a internet search history. Um, does that look familiar? Uh, yes, it, it does look like an internet uh, history. And who would have been the one doing that internet search? It looks like my internet history is something I would do. And what sort of sites were you visiting? Uh, Fauna Classified is uh, a, a website for reptiles and amphibians, uh, kingsnake.com, uh, advertisements. Um, basically, they're all places where people uh, buy, sell, and trade reptiles and amphibians. And then I see there's a, a gunbroker.com where I'd be uh, looking for the stolen guns to be sold. And so all that internet search history is trying to find somebody selling the animals that were stolen from you? Exactly, and uh, some of them have specifics, like I was looking for uh, a freshwater crocodile on this amazing Amazon, um, and one of the animals stolen was a, a crocodile. Um, and I think I heard you say you texted some people. I did, I texted and uh, messengered uh, quite a few people. Um, and we saw a lot of those text messages um, yesterday. Those were all text messages or Facebook messages that you sent? Uh, correct. And I want to ask you some questions about um, some of them. Um, so I see somebody with the name Andrew Ungerman, Pink Lucy AST Buyer. And who's that? Um, 
The pink Lucy ST buyer means uh, that he purchased a very rare color morph of an alligator, a snapping turtle. And so that's why I put that, because I have so many animal contacts, it reminded me uh, of who he was. So he was a gentleman that had purchased a very rare a turtle from me. And so that was somebody in the animal community? Correct. And some of the texts that you sent were to people that just had their full names. Did you recognize some of their names just from the animal community? Uh, some of them I recognized from the animal community as, uh, you know, more than just someone I dealt with a couple times and they were uh, friends of mine. And then I contacted people who are not in the reptile community also that, uh, you know, just might uh, know something that are either from the area. I, I spread the word uh, to everyone I could possibly think of that just may by chance have some information. Um, I want to ask you specifically about some of the text messages we saw yesterday. Um, there was one that said someone wrote their own death sentence. I just want the animals back ASAP so they don't get sick or sold multiple times. Do you remember that one from yesterday? I do. And what did you mean by that text message? Uh, I meant if someone has a Gaboon Viper that doesn't know what they're doing, it's an almost certainty if they get bit they're going to die. And whoever took them, as far as I know, wouldn't have been trained in how to handle them properly. And if they're trying to sell them multiple times, they're going to have to take pictures of them, handle them. It's just a disaster waiting to happen. You didn't mean that you were going to go kill the person responsible. Oh, no, absolutely not. Um, we also saw a message yesterday of something along the lines of, you're going to go hunting thieves. Do you remember that message from yesterday? It sounds familiar. And what did you mean by that? Uh, it means I'm going to try to track down leads. I'm going to try to find information. I'm going to uh, hunt down anything I can find out about who took the animals. You didn't mean literally like you're going to go on a hunt for like a hunt deer. Oh no, of course not. And I know we had seen another message um, about you filling out some paperwork. Do you remember what paperwork you had to fill out after these things were stolen from you? Um, yeah. Uh, April had one for the county and, and I had one for the, the city, uh, filling out um, which items were stolen. Uh, I know for the firearms they wanted a description, the serial numbers, uh, the value of them. Uh, and so I was filling out the forms uh, to turn into the police officers. And we saw a message yesterday that was sent by you I'm still filling out paperwork and hunting down the third. Yes. And is that in the same context that you use the word hunting? Yes, correct. Searching for. You weren't trying to, you know, go hunting with a gun and find these people. No. You were hunting them down, like tracking down where the animals were. Exactly. That's exactly right. Um, there was a, a message that was brought up yesterday about solving this will be solved on the streets do you remember mm -hmm. that message from yesterday i do and what did you mean by that message that means uh i was dedicating every moment all my efforts uh to this case because i was personally involved and i really cared about it and uh, i know the law enforcement agencies only have so much time uh, they have a lot of calls a lot of uh, complaints to deal with and so they can only dedicate so much time to it. And so when I was out there following every lead, contacting everybody I know, uh, trying to solve this mystery, uh, I figured uh, I would be more effective in a more timely manner to get this mystery solved and find out what happened and find the animals. So it sounds like by solving on the streets, you mean... Just like what was testified, you went on the street and were trying to find information about it. Yeah, absolutely. Were any of those messages 
in reference to wanting to hurt the person who took these things from you? Uh, no, absolutely not. To kill the person who took these things from you? Uh, no. Um, at some point, did you believe that Riley may have been involved? Uh, yes. Um, and what did you do with that information? Um, when I suspected Riley was involved, uh, I didn't have any evidence of it, but I, I uh, went to his place and spoke to him. And when you say his place? Uh, yeah, he had an upstairs apartment on Mill Street. Uh, earlier, earlier you testified he lived on Granite Street. Yes, when I first met him, he did live on Granite Street. And then at some point he moved to Mill Street. Yes. Um, have you been over to his place on Mill Street before? Uh, yes. And I'm going to show you what's been previously marked Exhibit 26. Can you see that okay, Bill? Uh, I, I can see it, but it's hard. To, I can't read any of the names. Okay, can you read that now? Maybe if I get it closer to you. Yes. And you can see this red dot up here. And is that where Riley's apartment was? Uh, that does look accurate, yes. And over on Mill Street? Yes. And that was this dot up here that I was pointing to? Yes, that's correct. And I have a green dot over here that is on Main Street. Yes. Is that about where your property was on Main Street? Yeah, that looks accurate. And I've labeled that 111 North Main Street? Yes. It's about accurate. Mm -hmm. I also have a, a blue-ish dot over on Van Street. And do you know who would live there? Uh, that would be Tara. Okay. That would be Tara's house right on Van Street? Yes. And so I mark down here this blue dot, Tara's house, 401 Van Street. That looks accurate. Now there's also a purple dot over here on the sort of right-hand side of the map down Royalton Street past Churchill. Do you know what would be there? Oh, uh, that looks like uh, the building we're in now. Okay, the courthouse? Yes. Is there anything attached to the courthouse? Uh, yeah, the uh, Wapaka County Sheriff's Department and the Wapaka County Jail. And you know, obviously, this layout. We've talked about your knowledge of the streets from your time as law enforcement. Yes. Is this a fair and accurate map and where all these points of interest would be? Yes. So you testified that you went over to Riley's apartment on Mill Street. Yes. Well, what happened when you went there? Uh, Tiffany Rose and I went there um, to ask Riley about it and to inform him about it um, because we thought he might be involved. And uh, we uh, went upstairs and uh, Riley and his friend Ashton were there. And uh, so I told them uh, we had been burglarized and a bunch of animals went missing and someone stole guns out of my car. You referenced Ashton. Did you know Ashton? Uh, I didn't know him. I, I had uh, seen him and, and met him a, a couple times around, but I didn't really know him. Okay. And so Riley and Ashton were there and you said you brought up the thefts. That's right. What was their response? Um, I got very defensive and uh, upset and uh, like offended that we would accuse him of being involved. Did he ask any questions? Uh, no, I was surprised by that. And um, when I was explaining what had happened and what was missing, um, he didn't ask any questions at all about any of the details. And do you know when you would have went over to Riley's apartment? It would have been the, uh, the day right after we found out everything was missing. The, the day after or the day of? Um, 
Or do you not remember? Well, the, the day after it went missing, so the, I guess it would be the, the night of the day we found it was all missing. Okay, so if they went missing the, between the night of October 14th and October 15th, if that's the frame of reference, what day would have you went over? It would have been October 15th. Okay. That evening? In the evening, yes. Okay. Did you threaten Riley at any time that night? Uh, no, not at all. Um, now I want to move forward. So we saw a bunch of these text messages that you're looking for information. Did you ever get any leads prior to October 19th? Uh, no. Um, on October 19th, where were you sort of later in the evening? I was at the East Road residence in the house. Who was all there? Uh, I was there. Uh, April was there. Tiffany Rose was there. And Rowan was there. And at that time, did you receive any information about the animals? Uh, we did. And what information was that? Um, Tiffany Rose got some uh, messages from Mackenzie. Uh, Who's Mackenzie? Uh, Mackenzie is um, the mother of uh, Riley's son and uh, ex-girlfriend. And you said that the messages from her had said what? Uh, she was calling or messaging to inform us to be careful because uh, Riley and Ashton had been asking for a ride out to rob me. And she said, you're going to get robbed, so be careful. And... And what was your reaction? The response was, oh my gosh, we already were robbed. Uh, all this stuff was taken. And then she said, well, Riley and Ashton did it. You testified that there was information that Riley and Ashton had asked for a ride? Uh, yeah, that's what she told us. And I think earlier you testified that you had given Riley rides before. Uh, yeah, all the time. I gave... Uh, Riley uh, rides, Mackenzie rides, uh, yeah, quite often. Did Riley have a vehicle? I uh, know never. Um, did Mackenzie indicate, or did you receive any information as to where the animals might be? Um, nothing concrete. She just said they may be at uh, uh, Ashton's mom's. Did you know where Ashton's mom lived? I did not. Do you have any idea where she might live? Uh, she said it was somewhere near uh, Highway 10 outside of Wyawega. And what did you do when you got that information from Mackenzie? Uh, while she was actually still on the phone, we uh, called the Sheriff's Department Dispatch Center. And I know we heard a, a call um, the other day. There was some communication we heard about you saying, do you want to talk to the police? Yes, the dispatch center asked if the person providing the information would be willing to talk to him. So we were trying to uh, have Mackenzie uh, meet up with an officer or speak to him on the phone so she could relay the information directly. Um, <clears throat> and did you contact anybody else that night? I did. Who did you contact? I contacted uh, Jeff Larson. And how do you know Jeff Larson? Uh, I, I know Jeff from um, contacts, uh, uh, him around town. Uh, he owns uh, quite a few properties. And uh, he was uh, Riley's landlord on Granite Street and on Mill Street. And he owned a building uh, next to my building. Why did you contact Jeff? Uh, because... Uh, he knows the area very well, and he was Riley's landlord, and I wanted to see if he was in town. And do you know if Jeff was able to determine whether Riley was in town? He said, yeah, I'm in town right across the street from his apartment. Uh, and he said he would uh, take a look and keep an eye on the place and see if anyone was home. And did he inform you as to whether Riley was home? He did. He, he responded and said that he saw, uh, he described Ashton and said, I see Ashton outside and I see other people inside, so I think Riley is home. And what did you do with that information? 
uh, I told him if he would be willing to stay there and just keep an eye on the place uh, and then I would let law enforcement know that uh, they were home and if they left I asked uh, Jeff to stay there until law enforcement arrived. When they left, you mean if law enforcement had left? No, if Riley and Ashton left. Okay, and you wanted Jeff to do what with that? Uh, report to law enforcement where they were. Um, he actually pulled his truck into the driveway uh, so the vehicle in the driveway couldn't leave. Uh, or, you know, or he'd have to move his vehicle to let them leave. And so then law enforcement arrived and he left. And Jeff left. After law enforcement arrived, yep. And at some point, did you text Jeff Larson about following Riley and Ashton if they left? Yeah, I wanted to make sure that their location was known so that uh, if law enforcement was on the way, they could find them, contact them, question them. And why did you, why were you hoping law enforcement would contact them and question them? Well, because we had some evidence to show that they were involved in the burglary and stealing of the animals, I wanted to find out the location of the animals. And I figured if law enforcement questioned them, they would find out where the animals were being kept. Law enforcement hopefully could use that information you had been able to provide. Exactly. Um, and did you text Jeff about leaving your house? I did. Um, and when you texted him, we, I don't know if you can see, we wrote up on the board the other day that Bill on his way, do you remember that testimony? I do. And was that because a text message was sent by you? Yes, I sent a message to, to Jeff Larson letting him know I was on my way to town. And when would have you sent that message? Uh, when I was leaving to go to town. So at 8.53 and 54 seconds p.m., Bill on his way, that was when you left East Road? I was driving, yeah, uh, probably down my driveway and getting onto East Road, yep. And where initially were you headed? I was going to uh, Mill Street to where Jeff was. In the city of Opaka? Correct. So I just added into town. You were heading into town into what happened. Correct. Did you ever make it to Mill Street? Uh, no, I did not. Why not? Um, I received a call from the law enforcement dispatch center um, letting me know that the officers didn't they were there and they didn't want me to go to Mill Street. I'm going to hand you what's been marked exhibit number 15. And we had some testimony that that was your phone call log, right? Yes, that's correct. I want you to direct your attention to call number 10. Can you indicate what time that call was made? It appears it was at 8.57 and 32 seconds p.m. 8.57 and 32 seconds? That's correct. And is that the phone call you were referencing that you got a call from law enforcement? Yeah, that call was initiated from the Sheriff's Department. And Because on the phone call log you see it was a call received by your phone. That's correct. Um, and so you said that law enforcement told you police are on Mill Street, don't come to Mill Street. That's correct. You testified from that that the call was at 8.57 and 32 seconds? Yes.
Okay, so I just wrote up here, 8.57 and 32 seconds p.m., Bill told not to go to Mill Street. That was based on the testimony? That's correct. And that's accurate based on what you've just said? Yes. I'm also going to write up on here, that it's a timeline. You would agree with that? Yes. And that was, I think, all from October 19th? Yes. I'm going to mark this timeline with an exhibit sticker, exhibit 77. Bill, you've been here throughout the trial listening and you've seen me write stuff up here on exhibit now 77? Yes. Is that all from what you remember seeing and hearing an accurate timeline of the evening of October 19th between 8.53.54 seconds p.m. to 10.20 and 3 seconds p.m.? Yes, that does look accurate. So you just testified that you were told to not go to Mill Street. That's correct. Where did you go? I uh, went to uh, park behind 111 North Main Street. And what did you do while you were waiting on Main Street? Um, just uh, talked with Tiffany Rose. Uh, Listen to the radio, smoke cigarettes. Uh, in from East Road into Wapaka, how would you get from East Road into Wapaka? Take uh, East Road to Highway K. I'd take it right on Highway K and follow that up to the stoplights. Uh, and then I would take a right uh, and I would continue under Highway 10, follow that around um, past the lake and then I would turn left on uh, say Main Street and uh, follow Main Street. And it seems like with all that driving it would take longer than less than four minutes? Yes, it would take uh, more than four minutes. And so, how long would you say that you were just sitting and waiting on Main Street? Uh, it seemed like uh, forever, but I, I would say probably about a half hour. And at some point, did you travel away from Main Street? Uh, yes. Um, while we were waiting uh, behind North Main Street, I ran out of cigarettes, so I uh, drove to Walgreens. And we heard earlier today that Wapaka has one Walgreens. The one and only on West Fulton Street. And that's west of your property on Main Street. That's correct. Um, and what did you do at Walgreens? I went inside and, and uh, uh, purchased cigarettes, um, possibly a beverage. And when you left, what did you do? Uh, got in the car, probably smoked a cigarette, and started driving back to Main Street. And did you see anyone when you were driving back to Main Street? Uh, yes, while we were driving, uh, we noticed uh, Tara driving. And where? in what direction was Tara driving? Uh, I believe it would be to towards the east. Okay. And you testified that you knew where Tara lived. We saw that on the map? Uh, yes, I've been there s several times before. Was she driving in the direction of going home? Yes, that's correct. Um, and did she make it home? Uh, yes, we actually uh, followed her and she did, went home. And... Um, I'm going to show you a video. You've seen the video before, but we're going to show the video again. I don't know. Are you able to see that TV, Bill? Uh, yes. Okay. Okay, so you can see the, the video that we're playing right now? Yes. Okay, we're just going to play it all the way through.
And obviously you were here when other people testified about this video, but what does that video show? It shows what appears to be a terrorist car pulling into the driveway and then a uh, short time after um, me driving my car pulling into her driveway. And when you pulled into your driveway, we saw both vehicles go off screen? Uh, yes. Why is that? Uh, the doorbell camera's field of vision uh, or whatever it records is on the front of the neighbor's house and the driveway goes back behind the houses back behind Tara's house and so we had to drive you know further back than the camera was so the driveway extends pretty far back yes does it go all the way sort of to the back of Tara's house yeah the, the garage you know is back set behind the house uh, it's a duplex and um, so there's kind of like two sections and it's kind of tucked back. And why did you pull all the way to the back? Uh, well, I didn't pull all the way to the back uh, because that's where her and the, um, the other people that live in the duplex parked. I parked um, behind her, um, but close to her door. Her door that we went in is on the back side of the house. Um, while you were there, if Tara needed to leave, would have you had to move your car? Uh, yes, I had the driveway pretty much blocked where my car was and hers was in front of mine. Um, you said you had been there previously. Uh, yes, I went there uh, on multiple occasions, uh, mostly to uh, drop off or pick up Jackson. And when you were there previously, had there been other people that were at Tara's house? Uh, yes. Have you ever been parked in? Uh, I, I have, and I also had parked in people, so I had to move. That sort of a fairly common thing to happen? Um, I wouldn't say it happened regularly, but it, it was definitely a possibility, and so it did happen more than once. Um, and how long were you at Tara's house for? <clears throat> uh, not very long. Um, I don't remember exactly, but you know, around five minutes. And I see you kind of glancing at exhibit 77 to help you. Yeah. And did you get a call from Officer Wazrud? I did. And what did Officer Wazrud call you for? Uh, he called and said, uh, are you uh, available to meet me uh, right now on Main Street? And uh, so I said, yes, I am. When you were at Tara's house, what were you talking to Tara about? Uh, we wanted to uh, first inform her that we had gotten this information from uh, McKenzie about uh, Riley and Ashton's involvement in the theft. And then we wanted to ask her if she had any other information, if she knew anything about where the animals were, uh, if she had even heard of it. And somebody else was home at Tara's house? Uh, yes, Tara's uh, daughter. And did her daughter's name, Daisha? That's correct. Um, did Tara indicate that she had any information? No, she said she didn't have any information, additional information at all. Um, was she aware of the animals had been gone, had been stolen? I really honestly don't remember if she knew or not. Um, I think she was aware of it. And what information did Daisha share with you? Uh, well, we had told her that uh, uh, we had gone on uh, Riley's Snapchat and seen some pictures. Uh, and so she said, oh, I'm on Riley's Snapchat too. I, I can pull it up and show you what uh, Riley had put on there. And did she? She did. Um, and what did you see on that Snapchat? Uh, we saw uh, the same photograph that has been shown here that we had seen. Uh, basically the same stuff that uh, Tiffany Rose saw on her phone that Riley had posted. So it 
sounds like it wasn't new information that Daisha shared with you that you didn't already have. No, it just uh, confirmed this stuff was posted for people to see that we had already seen on his account. Uh, so after you got the phone call, we can see that at some point you left. Yes. Um, and do you remember where you went? Uh, yeah, directly from her house to Main Street to meet with the officer. And we don't need to play the video again because we've seen it initially when you backed out of Tara's driveway. Did you start to go the wrong way? Uh, yeah. Um, and then you then pulled up to Shearer Street? Yeah, I realized you know I'm going the wrong way on a one way and so I turned around right away and went the right way. Okay. Um, and when you got to Main Street, is that where you met the police officer? Oh, that's correct. Um, and we can see uh, you met with him for some time. Uh, yes. Um, and we saw some parts of that conversation yesterday. What new information have you received from that police officer? Uh, that officer told me that uh, officers were at Mill Street and he informed me that uh, both Riley and Ashton were uh, taken into custody, um, which was news to me. Did he say why? I think he said they had warrants for their arrest. And did the officer tell you that Riley was going to be released? I believe so. Was that a concern to you? Yes. Why? Um, well, I was worried because if they questioned him about the burglary and the theft, the animals, and then released him, uh, there was a good chance he would go and try to destroy the evidence of the crime, which means the animals. And at this point, did you have any idea where the animals were? No. Were you worried about anything else with Riley being released? Uh, yeah, if he tried to move the animals, uh, he, if he was in a hurry, could definitely make a mistake and get killed by that Gaboon Viper. And if Riley were going to do that, how do you think he would get to wherever the animals were? Well, I knew he'd have to get a ride, and so... I figured he would probably go to Tara's house to see if Tara or uh, you know Madison or someone else would give him a ride. You said that you think possibly the officer told you that Riley was going to be released. Yes. Um, did the officer tell you when he would be released? No, the officer didn't know. Uh, I remember he said that the, um, the county who was investigating the theft of the animals may hold him for questioning. And there's no way to know if that's going to take a long time or not. Um, and the county, you mentioned the county, so the Wapaka County Sheriff's Department? That's correct. Um, and is that the same place where the jail is? Yes. So after you met with Officer Wazrud, we see that you called April. I did, yes. Why did you call April? Uh, I've been keeping in contact with her through the evening and law enforcement. She was uh, relaying messages for me and uh, I wanted to keep her informed that I had met with that officer, shared the information and what the officer had told me. Uh, at some point, was that call interrupted? It was. And you still have exhibit number 15 up in front of you? Yes, I do. Um, I want you to look at the phone call with April and Ted. And can you tell us how long that phone call is listed in duration? Uh, I'm trying to find the call. I believe that would be call number four. It says seven minutes and two seconds. And so we see that you called April at 10, 10, and 43 seconds p.m. That's and correct. The duration is listed as seven minutes? Seven minutes and two seconds. But we see that you received a call from Danielle about three minutes later. 
That's correct. Do you know why that would appear that way? Uh, yes. Um, on my cell phone, when I am on a call and another call comes in, it's a uh, like call waiting. And you can choose to ignore it or you can answer it. Um, and when I answered the call coming in, it didn't hang up with the first call. It just put it on hold like a call waiting. So the call duration was seven minutes because April was sort of on hold while the call with Danielle was going on. Uh, yeah, and we never reconnected. The, the call ended before we talked again, but okay. yeah. Um, and when your phone was ringing that it was Danielle calling, what did you do with the phone? I handed it to uh, Tiffany Rose. Why? Um, she knew Danielle uh, much better than I did, and uh, I figured she was the one that was going to talk to her because usually when Danielle called, it was for Tiffany Rose. And when you handed the phone to Tiffany, what did you do? I started driving. I, I pulled out from the uh, Main Street parking area uh, spot and started driving. And where were you driving? I was driving back to Tara's house. And so we saw on this map, do you remember the route that you took? Uh, yeah, I'm pretty sure I do. And what route was that? I would uh, pull out and drive on Main Street to the stoplight at Main and Badger, and I would take a left, and I would drive down Badger Street, which turns into School Street, and I would take School Street uh, to Van Street, and then I would turn onto Van Street. Okay, so you started at this green dot and drove south on Main Street? That's correct. And then you said you drove onto Badger? Yes. And that turns into School Street? Yes. And so that would be the way that you would take to get to Terrace House? Correct. And why were you driving back to Terrace House? A number of reasons. One, we told her that as soon as we were done meeting with the officers, we would return because uh, we had only been there a short time. Our conversation was interrupted by the phone call, so I said, we'll be back. Uh, and so that was the plan. Um, and then also, I was uh, concerned uh, that, you know, maybe she had some new information because if she had talked to anybody involved, like her daughter Mackenzie, uh, maybe someone found out more information about where the animals were and I wanted to see if she knew anything. And we saw that you had been meeting with that officer on Main Street for about 20 minutes? That's correct. Um, on your way, do you know who Tiffany was talking to during that phone call? Well, I knew she uh, started talking with Danielle because that, that's who called, and uh, I could tell that's uh, who she was talking to. Uh, but then I know it turned into uh, like a three-way call uh, where she was speaking uh, more with um, Ashton's mother. I think Angela is her name. And what do you remember Angela saying? Um, I know uh, she said that she uh, had the animals and they were in her basement. Uh, so we were really excited that they were located. We found out that she had them. And did she give you her address? Uh, yeah, she did. Um, and were you able to write down the address? Uh, no, not at all. I, I was still driving. And. Do you remember where, if you were driving from Main to Badger to School Street to Van, do you remember at what point in this drive that you found out the address to Angela? Uh, I can't say for sure. I know I was driving, uh, but it was we were pretty close to Tara's house already. So would you say you were close to Van Street? Yes. Um, while you were driving down School Street, did you see anybody? Yes. Um, do you know who you saw? Um, I saw someone uh, walking that I thought could be Riley. 
And why did you think it could be Riley? Uh, just because, uh, you know, I'd spent so much time with him. I knew, you know, kind of his, I don't know if you'd call it gestures or the way he handled himself, the way he walked. Uh, it just kind of resembled uh, Riley. Did you know it was Riley? I couldn't be certain because uh, it was very dark and he, it was a little further away. Um, but I, I thought it was. Bill, I'm going to hand you what's been marked Exhibit 78. I want you to take a look at that. Can you identify that? Uh, it looks like a, a picture of uh, School Street uh, at the intersection of Ann Street, looking down School Street. And does that look to be fair and accurate how School Street would appear at... at that intersection of school and Van Street? Uh, yes. I'm going to show you what's been marked Exhibit 79. Is that just an enlarged photo of Exhibit 78? Yes. And these are both fair and accurate of how that intersection was? Mm -hmm. Yes, correct. Now, obviously, this picture was taken during the day, but you were driving at night. That's correct. Harder to see all the details than it is in this picture? Yes. I'm going to hand you this marker, and on Exhibit 78, can you draw a little stick figure where you saw the person you thought could be Riley? I guess I can try to do that. There's a really skinny end of that Sharpie I just handed you. Sorry, I'm not very good at drawing stick people. I'm going to get that exhibit back from you. Now, are you still able to see exhibit 79? Uh, yeah. And I'm looking at your marking on exhibit 78, and it appears that you drew Riley sort of right in, right almost next to this electrical pole. That's correct. On the, uh, he would have been on the sidewalk there. And did you see where I just drew a little stick figure? Yes. Is that about the same location that you drew it on Exhibit 78? Yes. So that's where you saw somebody walking. Correct. And you were driving with your headlights on? Yes. Was this far down fully illuminated by your headlights? Well, it was kind of on the edge of the, the beam uh, range. Is that what made it hard to identify who that person was? Well, I wasn't 100% sure who it was, but it was enough light to say, I think that's Riley. And after you saw this person you thought could be Riley, what did you do? Uh, I asked Tiffany Rose, I said, is that Riley? Um, and I was surprised. I, I thought to myself, that can't be Riley. Um, he's in custody. But then I thought, it sure, sure it looks like him. But you testified that you thought or the officer told you Riley might be released. That's correct. Or would be released. That's correct. Um, but you were still surprised that that might have been Riley. Uh, yeah, because I had just got done meeting with the officer, 
And in my mind, I thought uh, if he had been placed into custody and questioned about the burglaries, it would probably take longer than that. You didn't expect to see him so quickly? Uh, no, not at all. I figured he would still be, you know, in the process of being questioned or possibly not released yet. At some point, did you turn down Van Street? Yes, I did. Why? Um, because I was going to Tara's house, and that's the way to, to go. But if you knew where the animals were, why did you still turn down Van Street? Well, we were getting the address, finding out where the animals were, and then I was already almost there to Tara's house and I saw what I thought might be Riley. And I thought if he's in close proximity and he wants to go and move, destroy, let loose the animals, he's probably going to go to Tara's to try to find a ride. And I wanted to make sure that didn't happen so I was going to run in and ask her quick, don't give him a ride. And you testified earlier about how many animals were missing. Yes. Approximately how long do you think it would have taken to get those animals out of Angela's house? It's hard to say. I'd never been there, but uh, I was told they were in a basement, which means, uh, you know, carrying them up the stairs, getting them out the house, getting them into the vehicle while keeping them warm. Uh, so, I mean, a minimum of a half hour. And... Were you afraid Riley might show up there? Exactly. That was my concern, that if he got a ride out there uh, while I was trying to pick up the animals, I wouldn't be able to get them home safely. Why didn't you just call Tara? Uh, well, Tiffany Rose was on my phone, uh, so I couldn't call. And I was right around the corner, so it was actually quicker to just stop. And I don't even know if I have Tara's phone number, to be honest. You said that Tiffany was still on the phone. Yeah, she was still talking with Angela uh, while I was turning on Van Street. And is that supported by the timeline that we have seen? Uh, yes, it is. It shows that I parked in front of Tara's house prior to the call with Daniel ending. And all these times you were after it as far as we all heard, right? Uh, yeah, it sounds like before you wrote them down, you established they were accurate. And so we saw on camera that you parked in front of Tara's house at 10, 17, 26 p.m.? That's correct. And that that phone call with Danielle didn't end until almost 20 seconds later? That's correct. Okay. And that's... Even if you had Tara's number, it sounds like you, you couldn't have called her. That's right. Yeah, my phone was already being used, um, and I was driving. Why didn't you wait and call the police? Uh, well, we were going to call police, but Angela specifically said, don't call the police. I don't want them to come out here again. So you pulled up in front of Tara's house. You parked in front of Tara's house. Yes. What did you do? Uh, I parked in front of her house so I could uh, quickly run in and, and ask her to not give Riley a ride and let her know we had found the location of the animals. So um, that was my plan, to get out and, and go to, to her door. Earlier, you had, when you went to Tara's house, you parked in her driveway. Yes. Why didn't you do that at that time? Um, well, when we first pulled in and followed her in, uh, we were planning on staying more than just a, a brief moment. And we didn't know how long we'd be there, and uh, it, there was no urgency. And this time, I wasn't planning on staying. I just wanted to quick run, tell her don't give Riley a ride if he comes and asks for one, because we're going out to retrieve the animals. We found out where they are and I was gonna run back to the car and then quick turn right there and be back on the route to where we were going to get the animals. We saw that on the map that 
If you were parked straight, you could have just quick turned on the shearer and then right back to school. Exactly. And from Terrace House, how would you get to Wailiga? I'd, I'd just turn left on shearer, which would take me right back to school. And then I could take School Street uh, to uh, Churchill Street, and then Churchill Street would run me right out to Highway 10. And then you could just take Highway 10 out to Wailiga. Correct. When you parked the car, what did you do? Uh, I parked the car, uh, put on the parking brake, and uh, opened my door. Uh, was Tiffany still on the phone? I think she was probably just ending the call at that time uh, when we were getting out of the car. And you mentioned when we were getting out of the car. Did Tiffany get out of the car as well? Yes, she did. I'm going to hand you what's been marked Exhibits 19, 20, 21, and 22. Do you recognize those exhibits? Uh, yes, it looks like um, pictures of Van Street. And you testified you've been to Terrace House many times. Is that how you're able to tell that that's Van Street? Uh, yes. And obviously, the, those photos were taken during the day. Yes. Uh, do you believe you could recognize Van Street at night? Uh, probably. Okay. I'm going to pull up two pictures. <laughs> this was on Exhibit 25. They will be on a different exhibit. Can you see the picture that I just pulled up on the screen? Uh, it's very dark, but yes. And what does that picture appear to be to you? Uh, it looks like uh, facing uh, down Van Street uh, towards uh, School Street. And why do you believe that to be the case? Uh, just based on the the layout of the road in the house front that I can see. And are you comparing it to one of the exhibits you have in front of you of Van Street during the day? Yes, it looks uh, very similar. And is there some feature in this photo in the dark that's also visible in those exhibits in front of you? Uh, there's a, the car. And anything else? Uh, well, there's a light on the front of that house and the, it illuminates the front of that house enough that I can see it. And that appears to be the same house. You're referring to the one on the left in this dark picture? Yeah, that's correct. And that's the same house that you can see in those pictures during the day? That's correct. So this is a fair and accurate depiction of how Van Street looks at night? Yes. I'm going to show you another picture. And can you identify what this picture might be? Uh, that looks like Van Street uh, facing the other direction. So Van Street facing Shearer? Correct. And what makes you believe that that's Van Street? Uh, again, uh, uh, it looks like the house on the right side has a light on in front and the car under the street light. And that appears to be the same that was in the other picture? Correct. And the house that we can see in this dark photo on the very right hand side, the one with the light on, that's the one we saw with the light on in the other picture? It appears that way. Okay. And is this a fair depiction of how Van Street would have appeared when you were there in the 10, 17 p.m. on October 19th? Objection. Yes. Oh, sorry. Was in a car with headlights. Have you been on Van Street in the dark in the fall before? Yes. Is this how Van Street appears in the dark during fall? Yes. Can you tell anything about this photo? 
It's very, very dark. Okay. Are you able to see it at, at all? I see one light uh, speck. Okay. That's and it. that's okay. We don't need to address that photo. I can see more on this screen, actually, than that screen. Okay. Where it looks like... Uh, I can see there's a street, um, but now I can't even see that. Okay. So we'll go put the first photo back up. It will be on whatever new thumb drive exhibit. Those are during the day. With the extra thumb drive. And both of these dark photos um, of Van Street at night, for the record, will be on exhibit 80 and they will be titled image 226 and image 232. Now Bill, looking at the exhibits you have in front of you, there's four separate exhibits? Yes. And they're actually two different photographs though, right? It looks like two different photographs and then two copies of each. And those are of Van Street during the day? Yes. I'm going to start with exhibit 20... Oh, well, we'll start with 23. And that matches what exhibit of yours? It looks like uh, 21 and 22. Exhibit 81, does that appear to be the same picture as Exhibit 23? Yes. And I'm showing you what's been marked Exhibit 82. Does that appear to be the same photograph as Exhibit 24? Uh, yes. After you parked on Van Street, you said you started to get out of the vehicle. Yes. What happened when you got out of the vehicle? I started heading uh, towards Tara's house. Uh, I got out and what, you know started walking past my car to her driveway. And in Exhibit 24, we can see a black car parked on the road. Yes. Um, is that approximately where you would have parked your vehicle? Yes, it, it looks to be about the same spot. And because this is Joseph Brown's house? The house next to Terrace house, yes. Um, the house with the camera on it? Yes. And so this vehicle parked here is right where about your vehicle would have been? Yes, and then Terrace driveway is right behind it. And if we're looking at Exhibit 23, would this be if you were standing sort of behind your vehicle? Yeah, that's correct. And whose driveway is this? That would be Tara's driveway. And so this would be facing towards School Street on Van right next to Tara's driveway? Yes, that's correct. You testified that you got out of your car and you started to walk towards Tara's driveway. Yes. What happened? Uh, before I got far at all, I saw someone running around the corner onto Van Street. <coughs> running from what corner? Uh, from the school street and around uh, from the school street sidewalk onto Van Street. And how do you know it was somebody running? Uh, I could see and hear someone running around the corner. Were you able to see where that person was? 
Uh, yes. Um, because in real life, it's a little easier to see than the dark photo we have up on the big screen. Yes. But that's still how dark it was? Yes. And who did you see? Uh, it turns out it was Riley. How do you know it was Riley? Uh, I had an idea it might be him based on seeing him coming down School Street, but then I knew for sure it was him uh, when he started yelling and yelling at me. What was he yelling? Uh, he was on, I'm going to get you, motherfucker. I'm going to beat your ass. He's like, uh, come fight me like a man. And you know Riley's voice? Uh, yeah, I do very well. So it, is it, at that point, you knew that it was Riley? I did. When he was yelling at me, I, I knew it was him. And so I'm going to hand you this marker on exhibit 20 and 22. I'd like you to mark, if you could, where you saw Riley as you got out of your car and approached Tara's driveway. When I first saw him? Yes. Uh, Twenty and twenty-two. Bill, <coughs> you just marked on exhibit twenty and twenty-two where you saw Riley when you first got out of your vehicle. Yes. As you were approaching Terrace Driveway. Correct. And certainly the this angle is a little bit easier to gauge distance. Ah, uh, yeah then straight down? Correct. Okay. Which exhibit was easier? Um, exhibit 20 and 24. Thank you. And so Bill, I don't know if you can see, was, was Riley in the road? Uh, yes. And it looks like on exhibit 20, which matches exhibit 24, you saw him sort of just after these garbage cans on the side of the road? Yes. I just placed a red mark on exhibit 24 where you have put a black mark on exhibit 20. Does that appear to be in the same location on exhibit 24 that you indicated on exhibit 20? Yes, it does. So this is where first saw Riley? Yes. So I just wrote on exhibit number 24, first saw Riley on van. Mm -hmm. That's accurate. And that's accurate based on what you just said? Yes. You still have, I'm going to give you these two exhibits. You testified you saw Riley in about that location and he was yelling, I'm going to get you curse word. Yes. Um, what did you do? Uh, I turned around and uh, I quickly went back to my car and uh, grabbed my shotgun. Where was Tiffany? Uh, she was outside the car um, going down towards School Street. Did you wait for Tiffany get, to get off the phone before you got out of the car? Um, 
I'm not 100% sure, but I believe so. Uh, so you and Tiffany are outside of the car initially? Yes. And when you see Riley, you just said you went back to the car. Yeah, when I heard him yelling at me, uh, I did. And what did you do at the car? I, uh, I grabbed my uh, shotgun, which was between the driver's seat and the center console. Why did you grab your shotgun? I was scared. Scared of what? Uh, scared of Riley. Uh, I was scared of him running at me. Why didn't you get in your car? Uh, Tiffany Rose wasn't in the car and uh, I was afraid that Riley would close the gap between me and the car uh, too quickly uh, to, for me to get in the car and, and try to drive away after getting Tiffany Rose back in the car. We heard some testimony your car is a manual transmission? Yes, it's a stick shift. Did that factor into your decision at all? It did. Uh, I know if I'm hurried, stressed, uh, or not paying attention, uh, I've stalled my car out uh, more than once. Uh, when I first try to go, uh, sometimes I mess up with the clutch and the gas and it dies. And I thought, there's a chance that could happen. And if Riley had closed the gap and got by you, what were you afraid of? Uh, he was coming at me to do harm and uh, I was worried uh, you know as you can see there's a lot of different tools and weapons in my car I didn't want them anywhere near those and you testified earlier that Riley is pretty fast very fast where was the shotgun in your car uh, right next to the driver's seat, uh, between that and the center console. And you said that as Riley was running at you, you were afraid of him. Yes, absolutely. You thought he would do some harm to you? Uh, almost certainly, I, yes. Was that based on some previous incidences between you and Riley? Uh, yeah, things that I had seen and heard, yes. Things that you had personally observed? Yes. Have you heard about other stuff? That's correct. We will take a recess. We are on the record outside the presence of the jury, Ms. Isherwood. Your Honor, um, I certainly don't believe we are to the point where a valid self-defense claim, sorry, I can't see you, I'll come over here, um, where a valid self-defense claim has been made. Um, what we know is that Riley was running down the street. We don't even know that. What Mr. Zielinski says is Riley was running down the street and... Um, Apparently, that made Mr. Zielinski scared so that he grabbed his shotgun. That, that is not um, anywhere near what is needed for self-defense. Mr. O, Mr. O, oh, sorry. And the use of deadly force. I mean, he grabbed the shotgun. Your Honor, thank you. I think this is clearly enough to establish uh, a legitimate self-defense claim at this point 
because Mr. Zelinsky would have the ability and the privilege to threaten the use of force to prevent or terminate an imminent and unlawful interference with this person. He just testified he saw Riley running directly at him down Van Street, yelling, I'm going to get you, I'm going to beat your ass. He certainly has the ability and privilege to threaten the use of force to terminate or prevent what he believes is an unlawful interference and imminent interference with this person at that moment. Ms. Isherwood? Well, that interference has to be reasonable as well. That's a jury question, Your Honor. That, that is a jury question. I mean, it has to be reasonable. His efforts have to be reasonable, and that's not to be decided now. This is simply, do I allow the more evidence in? The testimony was that Riley was running down the street, was making threats, and Mr. Zielinski said he was scared. He was almost certain he was going to do harm to him. I think that raises the issue when I'm going to allow the McMorris said evidence in now. You want to make any further record? So, but... And I didn't object until he got into what he had heard. I didn't object when he asked what he had personal knowledge of. But he still can't get hearsay in. And, Your Honor, that's not hearsay. It doesn't go to the truth of the matter asserted. It goes to the impact on Bill and his state of mind. And that's... That will require an instruction as to how it's to be utilized. But I think it is relevant in an ultimate decision of his state of mind and whether... and his reasonableness in his actions. But why don't you clarify? What are you expecting the response to be, Mr. Hogan? Of... What has he heard? From whom and what has he heard? Basically everything that we had addressed in the McMorris motion that he was told by Riley himself, by McKenzie, by McKenzie's mother about Riley being violent with McKenzie in February of 2020. Riley telling Bill about getting into a fight at the jail. Riley telling Bill about other fights he had been involved in. Personally observing... Bill personally observing Riley chase and make threats towards McKenzie. Generally talking about his anger issues with Bill. Bill personally witnessing Riley threaten Tiffany in the past. And then personally observing Riley wanting to fight and threatening Bill in the past. Ms. Isherwood? Yes. I'm not going to object, Your Honor. From what I heard is I didn't hear anything. It was statements that ostensibly Riley made towards Bill or others that were observed. So he can testify to it. Do we need to put anything else on the record before we bring the jury back? No. Okay. We're ready. I'll make sure they're ready, Your Honor. I figure we'll finish direct here tonight. I assume it's not that much longer. Of course, that bad assumption. I can tell the court we're definitely more than halfway through. Well, we'll see where we are at 530. Thank you.
Please be seated. We will go back to the record. You may proceed. Thank you. Bill, um, you testified that you were scared about Riley. Um, is that based on previous incidences with Riley? Uh, yes, that's correct. Things that you had seen? Yes. And things that you had heard? Yes. What is the first instance that you recall hearing about Riley's behavior that made you concerned? Uh, the first thing that um, made me very concerned uh, that I had heard about was uh, an incident that happened, I uh, believe, in February, uh, where he uh, he told me he had been drinking and went over to his Grand Street apartment, uh, C. McKenzie, and they got into an argument. And uh, that argument turned from a verbal argument to a physical uh, fight. And uh, pushing, slapping, uh, punching, and at some point, uh, he said he grabbed her by the neck, pushed her up against the wall, took her phone away from her. And uh, that really scared me. And he said that uh, they kept fighting and then uh, Tara came up to the apartment and uh, they got into a fight. And then the cops were called and he jumped out the window and ran off. And you said Riley had told you about that incident? Yeah, Riley did. He told me uh, about it. There was quite a lot of discussion about that incident because uh, it was a pretty major situation. Did anyone else tell you about that incident? Uh, yeah, uh, Riley told me about it. Then uh, Mackenzie uh, told me about it. Uh, Tara told me about it. And I also attended the court proceedings uh, for charges related to that incident. When you heard about all that, how did that make you feel? Uh, it's a pretty scary situation because um, Mackenzie and Tara told me that they thought he was uh, strangling or trying to, you know, kill her. And, uh, you know, the domestic abuse situation uh, is very concerning to me. Was there, do you know if, if Riley had been arrested for that? Uh, yes, he was ultimately arrested for that. Did you go to see him after he had been arrested? I did. I uh, went to visit him while he was in jail with his uh, mother. And how did that go? Uh, it went okay. He uh, didn't like being there, of course. Uh, he hated it. Um, we were trying to uh, help get him out of jail as soon as we could. Um, but he told me about another fight he had been in while he was in jail. And what did he tell you had happened? Uh, he said he was one of the younger guys in the pod. And so, uh, you know, didn't get the respect he thought he deserved from some of the other guys. And there was an older guy that, you know, kept mouthing off to him. And uh, he didn't like it. He didn't like what the guy was doing, picking on him or uh, making fun of him or just not respecting him. So uh, they went under the stairs there's a kind of a blind spot and the officers can't see and uh, they got in a fist fight and you know, we're punching each other and uh, he said it was a pretty good fight and uh, he actually uh, injured his hand. He showed me his, his hand where it was all swollen up from punching the guy in the face. What was his demeanor like when he was telling you this? Uh, he's kind of proud of himself. He was... Uh, you know, um, saying it like it was kind of bragging because he had won the fight. And then after that, he kind of had earned the respect of some other inmates by being a tough guy. And how did that make you feel? Uh, I was a little disappointed. Um, again, uh, uh, worried because, uh, you know, of the the violent tendency and, and also I you know, I was trying to help him and that wasn't a good route for him to go. And throughout your relationship with Riley, did he ever tell you about other fights he had been involved in? He did. Uh, he told me about several fights that he was in. And uh, I remember one, he, he was friends with a guy and 
uh, you know, for a long time they, they were friends, but then uh, distanced themselves and uh, he saw him outside of the quick trip and they got into a dispute and he told me that he just beat the guy's ass and uh, again won the fight. And was that the only other fight he had told you about? No, he told me about uh, a time uh, when he was visiting uh, Mackenzie in some apartments in Wyweega and uh, got into a argument and the downstairs neighbors, uh, he got in a fight with both of the neighbors, the downstairs neighbors. And uh, I actually, you know, talked to him about that and saw some, again, visible injuries from the fight. Was there ever an incident that you had personally observed? Uh, yes, there were a couple. Um, what What was the first incident you might have personally observed? Uh, one that really stands out in my mind is when uh, Mackenzie and Riley were both at the 111 North Main Street apartment uh, exchanging uh, Jackson and they got into some sort of a, a verbal argument uh, about uh, probably something to do with Jackson. And it escalated to the point where uh, they were both getting very agitated and uh, then uh, threatening each other. And um, then Mackenzie's like, I, I gotta get out of here. So she you know, fled out the back door. And did you actually see this? Yeah, I was there. I saw and heard everything. Um, it was um, very uh, aggressive, violent language. And then it spilled out into the alleyway and behind the, the building. And um, Mackenzie was with the stroller, you know, walking at an extremely fast pace, almost running to get away from O'Reilly. And he was chasing after her, uh, yelling and, and screaming at her. And um, I was really worried. Um, for a couple of reasons. One, uh, you know, Mackenzie had Jackson in the stroller and this was a very violent situation. And she was trying to get away from it and he just wouldn't let it go. And uh, he wasn't supposed to have contact with her at the time. And so I knew if they're yelling and screaming down the road, it's probably gonna get in trouble. And- uh, Did you hear anything that Riley was Sane. Yeah, he was threatening her. He said, I'm going to beat your ass. I'm going to kill you. Uh, it was like he was just enraged. And uh, she was just running to get away from him. And you mentioned that he was enraged. Did he ever talk to you about his anger issues? Yeah, he did. Uh, after we went all the way down Main Street, eventually, I actually caught up to him in my car and, and convinced him to get in my car and let her go and um, you know that day later I I said this just isn't good uh, let's talk about it and um, because they had a, a no contact and they were blatantly yelling and screaming right in the middle of Main Street I said well, why can't you just let it go and uh, he was explaining to me and I could see it that he said uh, when I get enraged like that when I get so angry uh, it just takes over. I just have this violent streak in me that I can't control. And once I get to a certain point of anger, uh, I, I can't stop. And I just, um, I saw it. I, I saw it with my own eyes and then he was describing it to me and he said he, he knew it was there. And how did that make you feel? I was very worried. Uh, it was scary. Um, it, it was scary and, and I was concerned and I, I wanted to help him, but I, I knew what he was talking about. I could see it. Did you ever witness anything between Riley and Tiffany? I did. And what happened that you had seen? Uh, there was another incident uh, in the apartment on 111 North Main Street where uh, Riley had come over and he, again he had been drinking and uh, Tiffany Rose was talking about, uh, about you know, staying sober and, and they got into an argument about it and uh, it escalated to a point where he wanted to fight her again physically. He wanted to call her out into the alley to, and he said, come on out here and fight me. You know, he wanted to beat her up. What did you do? Uh, 
I was like, no way. There's not going to be a fight in here. Uh, asked him to leave. Did he leave? He did. He left. He went outside and was in the alley, uh, you know, just yelling and saying, come out here and fight. Uh, and luckily she, of course, did not. And she ever, or did Riley actually leave the area at some point? Yeah. I mean, when it was apparent, he knew she wasn't coming out to fight him. Eventually, he just walked away. Was there ever a time that Riley had wanted to fight you? Yeah, there was. And tell me about that. Uh, it happened um, basically the night before the the burglaries and things went missing. Uh, Riley had come to the back door of the apartment again to come in. Um, I was in the front of the building, up by the store part. Um, but I could hear in the back, uh, Riley was wanting to come in. Um, but Tiffany Rose was very, very, very concerned about uh, COVID because she thought if she got it, she'd die uh, for, from other health complications. So she had a very strict policy that no one could come in without wearing a mask. And if they weren't COVID safe, she didn't want them in the apartment. Um, but Ashton and uh, another uh, female friend and Riley and Jackson came in to the apartment anyways. And uh, then Rowan went up to, to the apartment to see what was going on, and he came back and said, hey, you need to come back here and help. Did you go back there? I did. I went back, and uh, I could see Tiffany was uh, visually upset. And I said, hey, uh, does she want you in here, uh, or did she ask you to leave? And uh, Tiffany said, I want him to leave. And I said, uh, you guys need to go. If, if you don't have masks and, and you can't be COVID safe, you've got to leave now. And uh, so Ashton and the female friend did leave. They went out the door. And Riley said, no, I'm not going to leave. You can't make me. And I said, well, sure. This is her apartment. She says she doesn't want you here. I own the building. And I said, I don't want you here. So you're going to have to leave. Did he leave? Uh, eventually he did leave. And what happened after he left? Well, he went out the back door because he thought I was going to come out and fight him. And as soon as he went out the door, I locked the door behind him. So Rowan, Tiffany Rose, and I were inside, and uh, him and Ashton and the female friend were outside. And after you locked the door behind him, did he leave? Uh, no, not right away. He was uh, furious. He was yelling, screaming, because uh, he wanted me to come out and fight him. And I kind of tricked him, because when we walked to the door, he thought I might come out and fight him. And when I didn't go out and fight him, he wanted me to, and he was anticipating a fight that wasn't going to happen. You said he was yelling. Yeah. What was he yelling? Again, he's like, come out here and fight me. I'm going to beat your ass. Uh, you know, come out and fight me right now. I'm going to get you. I'm going to get you, mother effer. And how did that make you feel? Uh, I was worried. Uh, I mean, I knew that at that moment, uh, he was outside, I was inside. He actually jumped up onto the windows. There was windows in the back and was screaming through the windows. So we had a blocked the view. And then we actually left the back apartment area and went up front because he, he wasn't leaving. And I was, uh, I didn't want the interaction to go on any longer. Did he ultimately leave? Eventually, yes. And so when you went back to your car to get the shotgun, was all of that going through your head? Exactly. Uh, yes. Was there anything else that was going through your head about Riley at that point? Yeah, I mean, he was furious. He was yelling, screaming, running. Uh, I knew just days before that uh, he was most likely involved in taking two handguns out of my car. So there was a chance he had a handgun. He had a fanny pack. He could have had any sort of weapons, knives, guns. I didn't know. But I did know he was faster, stronger, quicker, more agile, and he wanted to hurt me. And because you thought he might have been involved in stealing your guns, when you went to your car and you grabbed your shotgun, 
First of all, where was the shotgun? It was again uh, right next to the front driver's seat between the driver's seat and the center console. The butt of the gun snugs right in between the seat and the console to keep it steady. Had it ever been in the back seat? Yes. And when did you move it up to the between the driver's seat and the center console? It's almost always in that position between the driver's seat and the center console in that white sleeve. It, did you actually keep it in the white sleeve? Yes. Um, and so when you went back to your car and, and got the shotgun, that it was at that time between the driver's seat and the center console? Correct. And what did you do when you grabbed it? I just grabbed the butt of it and uh, I put one hand on the, the butt of the gun and one hand on the sleeve because it very quickly draws out of the sleeve. And since I was in a hurry, I think that's probably how the sleeve got ripped. Uh, and I grabbed two shells that were right in the ashtray of the center council. I just flipped this uh, trigger or the mechanism on top that flops the gun open and popped the two shells in and flopped it back shut to load it. And once you loaded it, what did you do? Um, I'm not 100% certain, but I might have pulled the hammers back. I don't know. I can't remember exactly when I did that, but I know I took the gun and I turned on the flashlight and the red laser sight and I uh, started going uh, towards School Street. When you went to your car to get the gun, did you actually get inside the car or did you just lean in? No, I just leaned in. Okay. I could reach the, the gun from standing on the road. And so then after you stood back up, what did you do with the gun? Uh, I turned around and went uh, uh, towards Riley with it. and I. Uh, I pointed in his direction. And when you turned back down Van Street in Riley's direction, did you see Riley? Yes. And what was Riley doing? He was coming at me still, yelling and wanting to fight. And uh, I was surprised he was still coming at me. And you said that you had the gun pointed in his direction. Was it pointed at him? Uh, I wasn't aiming right at him yet, but I was, uh, yeah, that, that was my intention. Is I announced I, I have a gun, and I had the flashlight and the laser sight, you know, basically, yeah, pointed at him at, after I was going towards him. And you still have <clears throat> two exhibits in front of you? I do. Um, and a uh, Sharpie? Yeah. On Exhibit 19, I'd like you to draw where you saw Riley after you turned back down Van Street. <laughs> Once I had the gun, you mean? Yes. Did you draw him? Yes. And so that's where you saw Riley <clears throat> after you had got the gun out of the car. Yes. So I just drew on exhibit 82 a red mark where you drew on exhibit 19. Is that about where you had drawn Riley? Yes. And from what you remember, is that where you saw 
Riley after you turned back down Van Street? He once I had the gun uh, pointed at him, that's where he was. Now it looks like it's sort of in front of where the house is? Uh, he yeah, it's just a little past the, the house there. Okay. And once you saw him that close and you had the gun, what did you do? I told him, I said, I have a gun. I said, stop. I, uh, leave us alone. And what did Riley do? He, he kept yelling and coming. He, he, uh, he kept getting closer. So if Riley was running at you and you were scared to get the gun, why did you start walking towards Riley as he was running at you? Again, I had the gun. Uh, I wanted to make sure that he didn't get any closer to my car. Uh, I wanted to distance myself from the vehicle because I was worried if he didn't have a weapon on him, if he got to my car, he certainly would. Did he do anything when he saw the, the gun? No, I, uh, I was very surprised. I, I uh, thought for sure just having the gun and telling him and he saw a loaded shotgun pointed at him would make him stop, make him go away, leave us alone. But it did not. And at, at some point we saw the video, maybe we'll pull that video back up. Did you hand the gun to Tiffany? Uh, yes, I did. Why did you hand the gun to Tiffany? Uh, once Riley and I were within close proximity and I noticed the gun wasn't deterring him at all. It, it didn't stop him. He, it wasn't doing any good as far as making him stop attacking. So I thought, let me try something else. The threat of using the gun didn't work. So I gave her the gun because I had a, a flashlight stun gun inside my coat pocket that I had pulled out and I was gonna try to use that. So when you approached Riley and Riley was running at you, you had the gun in your hand? Yes. Why didn't you shoot him? Oh, I never would want to shoot him. Why not? Because uh, I cared about him a lot. He was my friend. I, I, you know, I didn't want to hurt him at all. Were you close enough that if you wanted to, you could have shot him? Oh, yeah, of course. Yes. And so at some point, you said you realized Riley didn't have a weapon and handed the gun to Tiffany. Yeah, I, I thought the threat of the gun didn't deter him at all. I'm going to try the taser because the electric current could stop him. It could, uh, you know, work in a way that nobody got hurt. We could resolve the issue. And so it sounds like you got the gun initially and then tried to use the stun gun just to stop Riley? Exactly. Uh, the electricity cracking on the stun gun, you can see it, you can hear it. Uh, he had seen it before, so I thought that might work. So I actually went and I lunged towards him to try to stun him with the stun gun because then the altercation could be over. You wanted to stop it without hurting Riley. Exactly. If I used the stun gun, I could stop the threat. Nobody got hurt. And did Riley do anything with his jacket at any point? Yes. When he was running towards me, wanting to fight, you know, uh, he was telling me, I'm coming to beat your ass. And while he was running, he, he took his jacket off, like preparing for a fight. And so at some point, because he had his jacket off, is that when you were able to determine he did not have a weapon? I didn't know for sure he didn't have a weapon, but I thought it was less likely that he had a weapon. He, I didn't see a weapon, and uh, when he took his jacket off, I could see more clearly. So I thought, eh, better chance that he didn't have one. And is, at that point, it sounds like is when you realize you might not need the gun. Correct. When you had the taser, were you able to tase Riley? I tried. I, I lunged, he backed up. I thought I had made contact 
with the skin, but it didn't do anything. It didn't work. And while I was trying to use the taser and it had no effect, uh, I was really nervous. I was really scared uh, because I was so close to him, I ended up dropping it. So let's pull up the video. And so this is the video. Are you able to see it? Yes. And so at this point, do you have the shotgun? Uh, Oh, the board's in the way. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so at this point, do you have the shotgun? We'll play it a little bit and then stop. I believe I do. Yes. Okay, so you had the gun. Yes. And now you actually were close almost right up to Riley. Correct, very close. And it looks like at that point, what are you gonna do with the shotgun? At that point, I was gonna hand it off to Tiffany Rose. And is it at that point you realized it's less likely Riley had a weapon? Yes, that's okay. correct, because I was close to him. And you, you said that that's mm -hmm. when you got your taser. Uh, yeah, at that point I thought maybe this taser would be more effective and could resolve the whole situation without anyone getting hurt. Okay, well, we'll play some more of the video. We kind of saw you sort of bend down. Is that when you had dropped the taser? Yeah, I, I believe that's when I, that's why I went towards him. That's why he backed up. That's I was lunging with the taser. I think I dropped it and I tried to, to pick it up, but I, I don't think I was able to. And what does Riley do at this point? Uh, he he uh, takes the opportunity to run towards my car. Okay. And so we'll play it some more. And we'll pause it right here. When that happens, what's going through your mind? Uh, I was really, really scared. I was worried. Uh, Tiffany Rose was saying he's going to steal your car. And all I could think of is if he gets in that car, there's all kinds of weapons in there. Were you afraid of, of Riley getting a hold of one of those weapons? Yeah, exactly. Why? Because uh, his intended purpose at that time was to do me harm. He was telling me, I'm going to beat your ass. I'm going to get you. Uh, if he grabbed a weapon out of my car, I was certain the next thing he was going to do with it is come at me with it. Did he actually get all the way in your car? I don't think so. So we'll play another part. And at that point, is that where you had grabbed the shotgun back? Yes, that's correct. And what's going through your head at that point? Uh, I'm just scared. I'm worried. I know uh, there's a bunch of knives, the bat. Uh, there's another gun in the trunk of the vehicle. Uh, I was just worried he was going to grab something. And did you see him grab anything? I did not, no. Because he was at your car, is that why you grabbed the gun back? Uh, yeah, that's correct. And the, the taser failed. It didn't work. I thought that would work. It didn't. Uh, he was at the car where there's a bunch of weapons. I thought I'd better grab the gun back. And do you remember what happened next? Uh, I remember I started to, to back up. Okay, so we'll play some more of that video. We'll pause. And we see, is that Riley walking away from the car? Yes. And what are you doing at that time? Uh, I'm pointing the, the gun with the flashlight down towards the ground and uh, taking a, a steps backwards. And why were you doing that? Uh, I wanted to stay away from him. I, I wanted some distance between us. At that time, were you intending to use the gun? Uh, no, I, just as a, 
a verbal uh, threat of force so he could see it. Okay, and we'll play some more. And we'll pause. Now, do you know why you were pointing the shotgun at the ground? Uh, yeah, because I wanted uh, it to be sa in a safe direction. I want at the ground is a safe direction in case uh, it accidentally went off. But it was also visible. Uh, you know, he could see it. You know, the whole gun. So, and we'll we'll just drag it to the very last second of the video. Um, so this is right where the video ends. Yes. And where about are you standing at that time? Uh, I'm standing uh, behind my car, uh, kind of in the entrance of Tara's driveway. And you testified earlier that your car was parked in about the same spot as the black car in this picture? Mm-hmm, that's correct. And you were behind your vehicle? That's correct. Where, and it's hard to see on the, the screen, where about was Riley? Uh, he was uh, kind of on the other, other side of Ann Street, uh, uh, you, you know, kind of um, from the driver's door towards uh, the other side of Ann Street. And if I set this right next to you, are you able to point to about where Riley was? Uh, probably over here. He was this far back? I would think so. Okay. And what's going through your head at that time? Um, at that exact moment, I, uh, I was relieved that he made a little distance between him and the car, so he wasn't in the car getting a weapon. But I was still scared, and I was still worried. He was still wanting to fight, and I, I didn't want to fight. I, I had no intention of fighting. And as the shotguns pointed to the ground, what happened next? Uh, I had the shotgun pointed at the ground, Riley was a distance away. He wanted to fight. I refused. I wasn't going to go towards him. I was backing up. He came at me very quickly. What did you do? Uh, I raised the shotgun up because he was coming at me fast. So I pulled the gun up from pointing at the ground to point it in his direction. And then what happened? He ran right up to me, uh, and he grabbed the gun. Do you remember where he grabbed the gun? Yeah, he grabbed uh, with both hands. He reached out and grabbed the foregrip and the front of the, the barrel by the flashlight. When he did that, what did you do? Uh, I tightened up my grip, and uh, I was so scared, I put my finger in the trigger guard. Where had your finger been before that moment? It was outside the trigger guard, uh, you know, along the side of it, not on the triggers at all. Is that something that you had been taught how to do? Yes. When Riley came at you and grabbed the shotgun, do you remember where in the trigger guard you had put your finger? I, I can't uh, I can't say I remember specifically because it happened very fast and I was very scared. And the reason I'm asking is because a double barrel shotgun actually has two triggers. Yes. And do you know why that is? Uh, each trigger uh, separately uh, fires e uh, one of the barrels. There's two barrels, two hammers, two triggers, and one trigger is associated with uh, one barrel. And so you have to pull them independently. So if you pulled one, could you pull the other one right away? Yes. You don't have to like reload it or anything? No. So when Riley grabbed it and you put your finger in the trigger guard, what happened at that point? Uh, I kind of pulled back on the gun towards me uh, like a little tug of war. And then he grabbed it or had it and he yanked it towards him 
even harder. And had you been in the same position about where you were in in this video? Yes, that's correct. And so if Riley came at you, would he have been facing Tara's house? Approximately, yes. And you mentioned there was a, like, a little tug of war. What happened at that point? Uh, when he grabbed it and started pulling on it, I pulled back. Then he pulled back even harder. When he pulled it hard, the gun came off my shoulder towards him. And in the process, my finger pulled the trigger. Did you try to pull the trigger? No. After the gun went off, what, what happened? He, uh, Riley stopped uh, pulling on the gun. Uh, it was free. There was a loud bang, and then he just stopped pulling. So uh, I immediately took a step backwards. What did Riley do? He, uh, he fell down to his knees. He went down to his knees and was... Uh, leaning forward like this with his hands on his chest, on his knees. Did you see blood at all? Uh, not at that point, no I did not. So what did you do? Uh, I took another step back and then I said I need to call 911. But I didn't have my phone, I didn't know where it was. So I told Tiffany Rose, I said I need my phone, we need to call 911 right now. And uh, so I went to the car to try to find my phone. What did you do with the gun? I uh, put it in the car uh, on the passenger seat pointing up. Uh, so it was, um, you know, visible but in a safe-ish location. And were you able to find your phone? I didn't find it. Uh, Tiffany Rose ended up having it. And is Tiffany the one who called 911? I asked her to dial the number 911 for me, and she did. Um, and what did she do with the phone after she called 911? Uh, before she even said anything, she handed the phone to me. Why were you able to stay so calm? Uh, it was difficult, but I had all the previous training and experience and all the emergency situations I had been in previously with uh, law enforcement that uh, it brought me back to that when I was uh, in this emergency situation. What was Tiffany's reaction? Uh, I think she was in shock. Uh, she called 911 and then just went over to the uh, curb. Did anyone come out of Tara's house? Yes, uh, a short time later, uh, Tara came out of the house. And were they, or was Tara emotional? Um, yes. Uh, I don't remember right at first, but very shortly after she was very emotional. And when you spoke to 911, did they tell you anything? Um, they more asked me questions, if I remember correctly. I don't think they um, told me much. Did they tell you how to render aid? No, not at all. Why didn't you approach Riley? Uh, I mean, immediately I was still scared. I mean, uh, I thought he... Uh, might come jump back up. I, I had no idea how or where or if he was really sh shot right away. I didn't know. Um, so I thought, you know, he could have a, a burst of adrenaline if he was wounded and come at me even more pissed off. So I wanted to keep my distance. Um, and then when I was on the phone at 911, that was the best, quickest emergency care I could do is to get on that phone and Tell them we needed help, send the ambulance. Do you 
feel that remaining calm helped you in talking to 911? Absolutely. With <clears throat> Tiffany's demeanor, do you think she, it would have been good for her to talk on the phone to 911? Uh, I don't think it would have been as effective as me talking. Um, she's very soft spoken and uh, in shock and, and uh, I just thought it would be better if I did it. Now at, at some point the police arrived. Yes. And what did you do? Uh, I kept my distance uh, from the gun and from Riley and stayed across the street because I had reported to them that uh, I was a shooter of a gun and I didn't want them to think that I was uh, trying to cause anyone any more harm. So I just stayed uh, away. When the police got there, were you ultimately placed into handcuffs? Yes. Did they take you anywhere? Uh, yeah, they put me in the back of a squad car and they drove me uh, from the jail quickly to the hospital and then parked outside the hospital. At that point, do you know what Riley's condition is? I know I, I was concerned. I asked multiple times, but they wouldn't tell me. At some point, did an officer finally tell you? Yes. And how did you feel when you found out? Very upset, very sad. Why? I don't want him to die. I care about him very much. Are you sad that he's passed away? Yeah, I'm very sad. I miss him very much. He was my friend. That night, did you want any of this to happen? Absolutely not. It's the worst thing. I never wanted it to happen. Did you intend for any of this to happen that night? Absolutely not. I have no further questions at this time, Your Honor. I think this is a good time to recess for the evening. Mr. Jerry, would anyone have difficulty being here at 8.30 in the morning? And I will see you then. Thank you for your service.